Nobody in the real world thinks I'm fat. In fact, I have chicks telling me they think I'm ripped in person. What the fuck are you talking about? You know, they said I was Ryback, but smaller than Ryback. Well, I'm only smaller than Ryback because I'm six inches shorter than him. In terms of lean body mass versus height, I'm actually just as big as Ryback. And if you guys go watch any of my training clips I've done this month, where you can see me standing up, walking around better, you'll get a better idea of that. If you just don't look at his delts and arms and you look at his back, chest, things like that, his legs, you'll realize that this photo, he is actually smaller than I am. Uh, and it's again, his arms are bigger, his delts are bigger, but his overall muscle mass, he's actually smaller than me at this point. And today we're going to be covering none other than Jeff Side. Now, I don't want people to think that I think Jeff is big because anyone who wants to question this can go ask Matt Ogus, Chris Lovato, any of the guys who have seen me in the same room in person with Jeff Side. Jeff Side is not big. I don't need to cover his stats because I'm convinced he adds 20 pounds to his numbers. He is nowhere near as big as the stats he puts out. And he is a lot smaller than I am personally. Now, I'm going to show you guys side by side two bodybuilders, competitive bodybuilders from different eras who are both six foot tall and 200 pounds. So if you put them in at about 6% body fat, that comes to 25.1 fat-free mass index. And here they are side by side. All right, the one on the left, you guys know that Serge Nubre, very, very famous bodybuilder. And then the one on the right is, is a Natty Pro. And you take someone like me, for example, when I show you the comparisons, you guys are gonna laugh. Because if you run my fat-free mass index, I, I'm, again, I'm holding a bit of water, obviously, but I stepped off the scale this morning at 232 pounds. I am five foot nine inches. If you plug me in at 25% body fat, which everyone always calls me obese, so, you know, let's say 25%. My fat-free mass index is up around 26. Okay, height insecurity among shorter men as historically been a problem that has even made it into the history books. We're like with Napoleon and us talking about the Napoleon complex. The worst thing that you can do is to allow that insecurity to eat you up and for it to make you express a fake or false overbearing confidence that shows insecurity because then you'll be called little Napoleon. Most of you are smaller than me. I am a hundred kilo power lifter. A lot of you may or may not know people write on forums, social media and things they do point out that I am actually a lot bigger than I appear to be in videos when I'm just standing there by myself and so you guys have someone next to me who is a fairly lean well not really lean right now by bodybuilding standards but lean by maybe normal people's standards who's at least 250 pounds it puts into perspective I'm not quite as small as some of you guys think I am and of course it's really amusing to me when I get comments from people saying that, well, you haven't really made very much progress for someone who knows so much about all of these different topics. You don't have very much muscle mass when I've put on around 50 pounds of muscle in two years time. And that's the exact opposite of what you want. What you need to do is to step back and assess this and say to yourself, I cannot change my height. I am the height that I am at. I have to accept it. I have to accept who I am. If you can't accept who you are, then there's no way you're going to convince other people that it's not an issue and then your insecurities are going to show through and you're going to have that Napoleon complex. What I recommend that you do, first of all, is tell yourself in your mind regularly, oftentimes look in the mirror, say my height doesn't matter. You need to express it out loud, believe it, that it is not an issue, that it absolutely doesn't matter. It's not important. It doesn't define you as a person, doesn't define your value, doesn't define your confidence. People can argue all day long about whether they think I'm jacked or not. I don't really give a shit. But by most standards, I'm pretty jacked. Look at my fucking back and hamstrings. Uh, do I really need more size on my back and hamstrings? I don't think so. You need to say these things out loud to affirm yourself because that's what programs your mind to believe it. The things that you say, your actions actually program beliefs in humans. A lot of people don't realize that. So actually saying something outwardly can program your internal mechanisms to eventually accept it and believe it. Your action, you have to have, take some sort of action that convinces your brain of it. I mean, I have way, way more muscle mass than any natural person on earth. And I know people will be like, what? Well, that's true. All right, that's just a simple reality. And the things that you tell yourself are always what you will eventually believe. Particularly if you hear your own mind saying it or your own words writing it, that will program your brain to believe it. All right, this is kind of funny. Uh, 
I've always said in videos, just been my experience with me being a Texan, that the women are a little more forward here. They, they do chase after the men a little more than I'm used to. Have I had some experiences with this? Yes, I have. And again, I've got to remind people, all of you who've met me in person realize that I, I actually look like I lift in person. I, I look like I have less fat and a lot more muscle than I do on video. I've had at least a dozen people say that randomly who've met me. Just the nature of it. So I just kind of laugh it off and uh, thank them for the compliment, tell them I have a nice day and go about my business. But it does happen. I wouldn't say it's something that happens all the time. I mean, these are one-off things. Something that happens once every couple months to me out in public somewhere. But in my experience, British women are a bit more forward than, than Texas women are in that regard. Uh, I don't claim to be natural. And again, people be like, why aren't you bigger? You guys haven't seen me in person, I guess. I'm bigger than you guys think. I'm a hell of a lot bigger than uh, Jerry Ward and Jeff Side and some of these guys you are talking about. Uh, but, you know, whatever. You don't have to believe me, guys. You know what? It's fine. Everyone thinks I'm lying. Whatever. Doesn't make a fuck. Doesn't make a fuck. Is when you are out in public, just present yourself and think of yourself and act as if you are average height. Make it a non-issue for you. Just walk around like you're average height or slightly taller. Don't exude a fake confidence with it and develop a certain strut or to puff yourself up. Because again, that will give you the Napoleon complex. Don't think about it. Just think I'm average height. Look guys, I know I'm not ripped. I'm not bodybuilder ripped. I'm not bodybuilder proportion, but tons of people have met me in person, including Big J, and they'll actually attest to that my stats really are what I'm saying. People who actually see me, you guys know where I train. Anyone is free to come up and meet me. But yeah, I have 18 inch arms. I have a 51 inch chest right now. I'm five foot nine, 220 pounds. So to give you guys the scale, just so that you guys can look at what 30 pounds looks like even next to me, we're putting these enormous Walmart baskets. So you need the daily affirmations for a while, preferably first thing in the morning or before bed. When you look in the mirror, say these things and that will program your brain and then to just go ahead and act and think consciously when you're out in public that you're the same height as everybody else. Average height or pretend that you're even an inch taller, slightly above average. And just think in those terms until it becomes second nature and you just behave that way. So I went and bought a tape today for this. Get it around. Get it over the top so we can't argue about it being too loose. All right, get it completely wrapped over. Oh, this is more work than I thought. Let's we'll see how junkies do this shit. Okay, let's pull the right one. Okay. Let's see where I'm at. And if you guys can see 17 and a quarter, pull that over, pull it tighter. Okay, I've got right at 17 and a quarter. I ripped my left bicep completely off the bone and have struggled with bicep development since. I did that in 2004 and I had 20 inch arms when I did that and there are photos up proving it. I had 20 inch arms when I ripped my bicep. 2004 and I've struggled with bicep development since that tear. Like when I was at my biggest as a lifter in my 20s, uh, when my arms were taping 20 inches and there are plenty of photos circulating around. It's not like I gotta hide it or anything. They're out there. Um, I put some up before. Yeah, I couldn't see it. Like I can honestly tell you that when I had 20 inch arms and I looked in the mirror, they looked like they were like 12 inches. I'm just like, fuck, you know, what, what do I do about this? Uh, when I was doing the hydrogen compressor work while training, I was still uh, benching 400 pounds and squatting 550, and I had been off of drugs. I had come completely off of gear for part of the, and I mean, I'd been off gear for a couple of years. Just showing up at the gym in a tank top and a pair of shorts and some chalk and a water bottle and training. And that's how I eventually got to the point years ago to where I could bench 475 pounds for a double. I could squat 585 for a triple without a belt. I had gone from where at the point when I got sick, I was benching 405 uh, raw, and I was able to squat 550 without any sort of wraps or sleeves at the time. Drug free in my late 20s. I still managed to get to the gym five days a week. How did I do it? I did it immediately after 
work. So I would work 12 hours Monday through Friday, then have the weekends off to relax, party, do my thing. So I would come in and do one or two heavy sets of squats, one heavy set of deadlifts, do some band crunches, and go home. And I would be in and out of the gym in 20 minutes. Five days a week, 20 minutes, in and out, go home. On the way home from work, even though you might be lifting pretty heavy, and yeah, those triples, I would be up over 500 pounds on my squats. Yeah, my triple days on the on the bench press, I would be doing like 365, 375, or triples, because I was still pretty strong back then in my 20s. And I was now physically sick. I had gone from still being able to train all the time, being able to bench 400 pounds, being able to squat 550 raw at that time. You guys have looked at older pictures of me that you've seen floating around the web. You guys will notice that my triceps were pretty massive at one point. A hell of a lot bigger than they are now. That's when I was doing a lot of reverse grip bench pressing. It really brought my triceps up a lot. And I used to do 500 pounds on that lift. Uh, now, I used to actually use the reverse grip bench press quite a bit in my 20s. I was obviously a lot bigger and stronger then. I'll kind of flip in a photo so you guys can see that to get an idea. Uh, back at that time, I was probably able to uh, reverse grip 500 pounds for a max. Yes, I'm someone who has done 500 pounds on this exercise. I used to do work sets with 405 on this exercise. Um, you're invariably going to drop this bar on this exercise sooner or later. Uh, and that becomes the problem. You will eventually do it. Um, I've done it. And that's kind of the, the problem. I've dropped 405 on my chest uh, inside the power rack doing it exactly that way. And it did bruise me pretty good. Did I get a real injury? No. Did I hurt my thumb? No, because I was using a false grip. But it has slipped out. It has hit my chest and knocked me back, back down. Put some nice big old black bruise across both of my pecs with a bar hit with 400 pounds or 405. I could bench over 450 pounds raw. I could squat almost 600 pounds without a belt. Something like 585. I could hit it to full depth with no belt at the time. But the truth of the matter is, 99% of you out there, even if you use anabolic steroids, will never close grip bench press full range of motion 400 pounds. All right? That's the real world. The majority of you out there genetically do not have the strength to get there with training and even moderate doses of steroids. You do not have the genetics or the structure to do that. That's the real world. Who, who close grips 405? Um, well, I used to close grip 405 for reps. I do not currently bench 405. I used to, however, do sets of five with 405, five rep sets on the close grip bench press back when I was young and virile in my late 20s. And you guys have seen plenty of photos of that when I was actually really big. Uh, the other thing that can pull you to the left sometimes with a handgun is gripping the gun too tight. Most of you guys know, you guys, some of the people who watch my fitness channel watch me rep out 500 pounds for, you know, five, six, seven reps without straps on the deadlift. I obviously have a pretty strong grip, uh, so I'm worried about that. So I'm consciously loosening up my grip a little bit on the left hand and using, or with the right hand and using the left to tighten a little bit uh, to keep control of the weapon uh, just to make sure I'm not squeezing that. I actually almost worry about me crushing the polymer on a Glock. Uh, because of that and for most people that isn't a concern, but you guys got to think about how much grip work I do Yeah, it, it actually be possible for me to break my handgun a lot of guys seem to think the leg press is amazing to leg press over a thousand pounds It really isn't uh, That's why I don't bother with a leg press it takes all day to load this slide up and get people to climb on top of it I'm a 500 plus pound raw <laughs> squatter. So for me, I mean I need probably 2,500 pounds on a leg press to, to get adequate resistance Which means putting guys up on top of it also it's stupid I have a fast metabolism. I mean, I'm cutting right now. Right now, I'm actually eating 3,800 calories every day, up to 4,000 every day right now, and everyone's going, you're getting leaner. It's how fast my metabolism is and the amount of activity that I do. I'm losing fat on that. Well, for me, because I'm trying to not gain <laughs> any more fat right now, I'm trying to at least recomposition a bit, and my appetite is insane. And for me, if I want to only eat 4,000 calories of ultra high fiber food in a day, I can't really get away with much wiggle room on junk food or I will eat 5,000 calories. Because for me, on a mixed diet like that where I have a few sweets and things, 5,000 calories is my normal appetite. I get hungry on 4,000 calories and 
80 to 100 grams of fiber a day. I, I actually get hungry eating that while doing intermittent fasting. And when you have a partner who is obsessively insecure and they will not let you do a cut or they, they interfere with your dietary habits and things and they're very emotional about it, believe me, you will find that it can be very difficult to do certain things to eat the way you want to eat on different levels if you have someone who is that adamant about it and you live with them and they're your partner. And obviously, you guys have seen as soon as I ended that situation and became single again, I've been able to lose 40 pounds really, really fast. So it's very clear that that was definitely a factor. I have a confession to make. For about the past month, I have really slacked off on my cardio. And accordingly, I have not lost any weight while eating my 4,000 calorie high carb diet. I've pretty much just recomped a little bit. I am a voracious eater. I'm one of those guys who can eat six or 7,000 calories without even batting an eyelid. Uh, because I am an overeater. I have an insane appetite. Multiple people in my family, three to 400 pounds. Of course, at least one NFL player in there because of that, uh, who is over 300 pounds. But I eat a lot. I'm very, very hungry. I have to use a different strategy than a lot of people do just to keep from getting really fat. For me, that strategy is I load up on tons of vegetables, brown rice, beans, dry chicken, bland, satiating foods all day long. And you know, I can eat 4,000 calories of that stuff without even thinking about it almost. I mean, guys, I have days with me, I, I don't even eat junk food anymore. I eat a completely bro diet and I've gained weight unintentionally while doing cardio every day, living on like brown rice, whole wheat pasta, lean, lean beef, like 95 to 97% uh, lean beef, chicken breast, Greek yogurt, oats. That's what I eat, big ass salads. You guys see all my salads at Jason's Deli. I sometimes have on my non-training days, I get up and do an hour of fasted cardio in the morning. And sometimes I don't bother to eat till noon or one o'clock on my, my non-lifting days. Particularly when I go out to the rifle range, I spend my whole morning at the rifle range on those days. Uh, this, I can still easily make the scale go up eating nothing but bro foods in a little short window with only like three meals. I mean, stop and think about that. Do uh, you guys really want to weigh more than I do? But I've sat right here and walked into a restaurant before. Well, not a restaurant, a fast food chain. One of my friends wanted a burger. And as you guys can see, everyone keeps talking about, oh, you're getting fatter, you're getting fatter. No, guys, I'm sitting down. It's camera angles and lighting. As you guys can see with me standing up, am I bigger? Yes. Have I gained body weight? Yes. Have I gained fat? No, I haven't. Um, my belt sizes are the same. My pants sizes are the same. I'm in the same loop on my belt, which means my waistline is not getting bigger. Uh, what you guys see sometimes, again, because I'm sitting down, sometimes I'm leaning forward doing stuff, everyone's stomach pokes out a little bit. Even ripped guys, their stomach pokes out a little bit when they're sitting down. Welcome to the real world. It's just angles. And obviously, I eat a really high fiber diet. I eat brown rice and stuff every single day. You guys see my salads and stuff on Instagram. When you eat four plates of salad and a couple of big bowls of brown rice, your stomach is going to stick out more. That's just common sense, guys. It's called fiber and roughage. Uh, but when you know you're at a healthy body fat, just sit down after you've had a meal, after you've had a bunch of fiber particularly, you've had a big salad or a bunch of whole grains, sit down and just chill and have someone come over and snap photos when you're completely relaxed and you're going to be shocked. Of course, your stomach's going to distend a bit. Uh, we've even seen photos back in the day of Arnold Schwarzenegger looking like that. So at the end of the day, guys, the take home message here and what is important to remember is that humans, our natural diet is to eat everything. And we are cooked food eaters, cooked meat eaters, and we are the single most successful species anywhere in the world of being able to find foods around us anywhere that we go, even thousands and thousands of miles from where we originated and to thrive on it. And I would say making a statement like that really is not addressing the fact that humans as a species are kind of wannabe meat eaters, but we're really are herbivores. Now we've adapted to some extent to eat meat over eating cooked meat for the last couple million years, but we really are <laughs> biologically speaking herbivores. But a lot of this stuff just gets kooky uh, when people start following these really weird rigid diets or actually saying things like a raw vegan diet is the natural diet for a human. No, it's not. Uh, have you never opened an <laughs> anthropology book? 
Now, the idea that humans are raw food eaters is just scientifically and historically not true. We are actually cooked food eaters. So another perfect example of the way this stuff goes. You can be an omnivore, you can be vegetarian, you can be a vegan, any of those things and be completely healthy, live to be 100. You could compete at the elite levels and top sports, you could win gold medals in a wide variety of sports while eating any of those three dietary approaches. All three have equal health potential and performance potential for an athlete, in my opinion. People are promoting a diet that for the majority of people isn't sustainable. There are some people who've been vegan and stayed vegan for 50 years. They are the exception to the rule, not the norm. Most of you are going to find it to be unsustainable like I did. Me personally, like I've said in the other videos, I perform better as an athlete, I've lost a lot of body fat, I'm able to control cravings, I feel better and fuller and have more energy on a lot less calories now that I'm doing a high meat ketogenic style diet. I feel better, my blood work looks better, I'm happier as a person for it. Okay, this is, I'm, as someone who's a vegan this, and who actually really does know nutrition, a lot of vegans don't know nutrition. Because a vegan diet, you could be on a vegan diet and have one completely different set of macronutrients and calorie intake and still be on a vegan diet and eat something that's the exact opposite. You could, at 80, 10, 10 as a vegan diet, you could do a ketogenic vegan diet, which is the opposite extreme. You could do a, a very ultra high protein vegan diet and you're still vegan, but it's still the composition of your diet, your total carbs, fat, proteins, micronutrients, fiber that are going to impact how you perform as an athlete not the, the the fact that you've excluded certain foods from the diet not relevant most people don't realize the only people who might struggle to get enough protein for gains in are usually going to be maybe vegans i'm reminding everyone for people who seem to think i'm a vegan guys i was a vegan for a short period of time and i told you guys months ago that i, I stopped the vegan thing and went into why and it doesn't work for me. I don't feel that it works for me. I gain strength and muscle really, really well on vegan diets. I struggle with cutting on them. I just don't get satiety and my blood sugar doesn't feel right. I have problems when I'm trying to cut on a vegan diet when I go into a calorie deficit. It just, I run into a lot of problems. It's not workable for me. I was hungry all the time as a vegan. No matter how much food I ate, even raw vegan food, I was hungry all the time. And I would gain weight because I would eat 5,000 or 6,000 calories a day and try to tell myself I'm only eating 4,000 and the scale weight would go up. I would add more cardio in. I was up to where I was lifting every day and doing two hours of cardio a day just to try to control the caloric intake from my hunger as a vegan. And I mean, that could even be raw fruit with some veggies thrown in. I would eat like three watermelons in a day and be hungry and still go to bed hungry. There's no reason for me to go vegan. I only see negatives and no positives. And in the long term, though, I would, like I said, I would love to go to eating wild game as my 10% of my animal products every day that I hunt myself, but that's going to be a, a longer term endeavor. And it's because there are four types of people who are drawn to veganism from what I can see and my own experience observing them, interacting with them, uh, things I've seen in vegan communities online, because I was one for almost six months or so. And I did go to vegan meetings and talk to a lot of different vegans and people inside that, that world. But then you have the true sociopath who's drawn to veganism, the exact opposite of group one. The sociopath is drawn to this group as a way to mask the fact that they are a sociopath. And I've met several of these, and you can tell because of certain things they say. When they say things like, well, I don't really care about people. All humans can be exterminated for as far as I'm concerned. I'm concerned about the innocent animals. It's not even an issue for me of life itself. I don't consider life to be sacred at all. I don't put any value on life as far as the, the biological function of life. I put a value on sentience and I put a value on innocent life. So what they do is they want to talk about the animals as if they're above people and that is again so that they can find a social mask, a socially acceptable mask for their sociopathology, which means their inability to relate to and empathize with other humans. I finally made the push to say, look, I'm not going to flip flop back and forth between being vegetarian anymore. And then I went pretty much mostly vegan shortly after. But the, the thing was, I was watching one of the things on factory farming, and I saw a case to where a steer had had his throat slit, and his esophagus was hanging out, and he was flopping as he died. And that scene for me is what pushed me over the edge. I know these animals. I've been around them. They know what death is. Because I've seen the way they react to it. They, they go to places to die if they live old enough to do it. 
they mourn for their dead. And that animal knew he was dying, and I could tell at that point. This was an innocent animal that had never harmed anyone. He was no threat to anyone. He knew he was being killed. He didn't want to die. And he was flopping in reaction to it. Now, had this been a murderer or a pedophile or something, I probably wouldn't care. But this was an innocent, sentient being who was dying because someone enjoyed the taste of his meat. Not for their health, not for nutritional need, not for something that they needed, but just for pleasure. And I have a problem with that. I have an ethical problem with that. And again, I saw a lot of this. So I just don't really don't care. Animals are innocent. Animals are innocent and helpless than humans. And so I care more about them than human beings. And they're just like, I don't care if humanity dies off. And I've met a lot of those inside some of the vegan groups. And so it does seem weird to me that someone can't understand that when to me it makes perfect sense. And someone says, well, if you enjoy eating meat, then just eat meat. And I would say, well, if you enjoy raping women, just go rape a woman. I mean, it fucking feels good, right? We don't have respect for these animals at all. Uh, we put them through a life of hell. We've created a living hell on earth for them. And I think that the rape analogy I gave is a very accurate an analogy. And for someone who says that belittles rape, I would say, well, you know, no, I would say that rape is probably not as bad as what we do to animals. That is a sign of your true sociopath. They can't relate to other humans. They don't have real empathy for other humans. This is the, the most dangerous type of the vegan because they'll also pretend to be one of the other types as well. And the problem you have is that you have a community here to where we know from the research out there and the data, people who are sociopaths tend to like to prey on group number one there, the people who are empathic. And we've essentially created a whole new system of slavery, torture, and a new holocaust of billions of sentient beings who pose no threat to any of us, have done no harm to any of us, purely for our own pleasure. And the sad thing is we can eat meat substitutes that taste pretty much the same. And that's what I do now because I enjoy the pleasure. I love the taste of beef, but it's not necessary for this to happen for that. Which again, I find vegan diets do not fill me up. I cannot eat enough food to feel full. And I struggled to keep my body weight under control. I would gain weight at an enormous rate. I would gain body fat at an enormous rate. I found it horrifically bad for doing that because I would crave meat 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I would crave steak. And I would try everything to try to deal with those cravings. Every strategy for people say, well, why didn't you try this, try that? It's funny because people will say that. And I did try those things. They didn't work. I got tips from tons of vegan experts. I could absolutely not make the diet work. And the thing is, if, since I couldn't make it work, why would I go back and do it again? I don't have an ethical issue with eating meat. I freely admit, I love the taste of meat. I love it. But I have an ethical situation that does not allow me personally to eat a dead animal. And so for me, what I do is I eat meat substitutes, ones that happen to taste good that I like, and I eat those because they fill a role in my diet. And that role is not just one of getting some extra protein in, because they tend to be very high protein, although they're very high fiber protein sources, is that I have found ones that taste close enough to the real deal that I meet that need that I have to enjoy that taste and the texture of meat and it feels like I'm eating meat so I get to enjoy that thing that I enjoy from a flavor perspective but I do so without the ethical ramifications that I personally can't live with and so it does seem weird to me that someone can't understand that when to me it makes perfect sense contrary to what a lot of vegans are saying we do crave meat I crave meat I couldn't handle my meat cravings after months and months without it I tried everything from eating peanut butter to get the salty taste of of, of meat with fat at the same time and then soaking a penny under my tongue to get the coppery taste of blood because I happen to like raw or rare meat myself. I, I love like blue steaks. Trying to fulfill that craving, I would put a penny under my tongue trying to deal with it. I tried that for about a month and it only helped for about a week. And if you're one of those really sensitive people, number one, and you're very empathic and compassionate, you need to be able to pick out group number four 
and avoid them at all costs. Not just avoid them on the internet, but definitely make sure that you don't form real life friendships and bonds and relationships with these people because it could put you into direct harm. I, and I'm not militant about it. I don't do the whole militant thing of guilting other people, attacking other people for their choices because quite frankly, it doesn't work. And while I understand, because I understand how passionate people are about this who get involved in it, and I am that passionate, that they want to initiate that change because they see it as effectively a holocaust and slavery, which it is. But attacking other people about it, screaming at them about it, guilt tripping them about it, is only going to make the problem worse because when you attack people for their personal choices or you try to make them feel guilty, you push those people away. That is the absolute worst thing people could do. I think the best thing that people can do is non-judgmental awareness lead by example when it comes to something like this. I think the militant approach does the exact opposite of the attendant effect. You just, you turn people off to the idea. All right, guys, so that's my take on it. And that's my advice. Take it or leave it. And also, if you don't eat bacon, you're a little fucking bitch. And yeah, I did a lot of primitive weapon hunting. And for me, I used to do, I've gone and I've done horseback hunting up in Colorado and hunted elk on horseback. I used to bow hunt deer and I used to do close up hunting where I would go out in the woods to hunt wild pigs in Texas with a ghillie suit on, skunk spray to mask my scent and either a spear or a bowie knife and I would stalk them. I grew up the first seven years of my life on a cattle ranch. My family maintained it and I went back later even as a teen and did work there. And I have personally helped dehorn cows. I have helped castrate cows. I have helped with the slaughter of cows. This is something I have personal experience with. I used to go to the deer lodges every winter with my grandfather. I've hunted white-tailed deer. I've hunted mule deer. I've hunted elk up in Colorado on horseback. And I have even hunted wild boar on foot with a knife. I have killed seven wild boars with a bowie knife. Firearms, I started shooting at age six. Uh, all through my teenage years, starting at age 12, I did shoot thousand yard rifle competition. And yes, that was even with an ear problem. I wore earmuffs. So um, shooting and hand loading and precision rifle shooting was something I did at a competitive level through my teens. And so it was just an intrinsic part of my lifestyle. Um, I was a competitive shooter in my teens. You don't think that we used drugs? You've never heard of beta blockers? I grew up as a very avid hunter. I've done all the primitive weapon hunting. I've hunted wild boar with a knife. I've hunted them with spears. I've done a lot of deer hunting. I've done elk hunting. And some people do it for their ego or philosophical reasons, but you know what? I used to hunt dangerous game on foot um, for philosophical reasons, but most of you would say that's really fucking stupid, Jason. Um, you're a fucking idiot. Uh, but yeah, I did that with some of my family and everything. Hunting wild boar with knives on foot. And anyone who's familiar with the feral hogs in Texas understands that that is a dangerous animal. That animal can kill you. It can definitely put 50 or 60 stitches in you. Uh, with those tusks, some of them get up over 200 pounds. We hunt them on foot with a knife. And they are aggressive. Like, I'd love to get up and go hunt mountain lions again. Uh, up in Colorado or something later on to uh, see if I could get a draw on one of the licenses. I'd love to do that. I'd do that in a heartbeat. Absolutely. So, yes, if we cloned these dinosaurs, I would say to all these civilized leftist social justice warriors, yes, I would go and hunt one. And do you know why? Because that is a big, dangerous, rare animal. It's not going to be a limited resource if we started making them anyways. And to go out there and prove that I am fit to lead. And I would definitely go hunt a Velociraptor or a T-Rex. Might need a really big gun for that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. On foot. So, uh, I, but I came to terms with the fact that I am a hunter, that I'm a killer, and I'm okay with that. People have this mentality and they just hate. And the thing that I learned really early on is that you can utilize that mentality, that hatred, and it just the hater dome that exists there to your financial benefit. And me even revealing that isn't going to hurt me in any way. 
Lately, the channel has been getting hit by trolls and spammers from a couple different sources at this point, not only the other forum of other people who are harassing me and making hundreds of accounts, but our favorite mentally handicapped person has also called his Legion of Piss Troopers on my channel again, and so I'm banning upwards of 200 people a day right now. So what I've marketed myself on is the haters. That crab in the bucket mentality, the people that when they see you getting outreach, they get angry because they can't do it and maybe they have jobs that they hate and so then they want to, to shit talk you and say terrible things about you all the time. And here's the thing, I love those people. I love them. They're making me money. I wouldn't be making the type of money that I'm making doing what I do if it wasn't for all those hundreds and thousands of haters who talk about me negatively everywhere, who even go and they post on my video comments. They're making me money by posting in the comments and the ads rolling. And when they post, sometimes people see it on their Google Plus and it spreads. And on forums, their threads started and all over Facebook, people talk smack about me. From now on, as you notice, I'm banning all trolls. No exceptions. You come in my channel, you say something stupid that makes you sound like a fucking idiot, you're banned. You throw a personal insult at me, you're banned. You come in and you sound like Jason Genova saying it's shit, it piss, order 66, Dorian Yates barn door back, you're fucking banned. The private business and private property owners have the right to tell people they can't say certain things on their property and they can ask them to leave or command them to leave immediately if they say something they don't like. Well, the same applies to the internet businesses. If you put stuff on people's various uh, business or private walls or um, comment sections or anything else, they have an absolute right to remove you. Those people just hating on me and spreading my name, even if everyone who hears this message stops. So it doesn't even matter at that point. It becomes uh, just a ball that just keeps rolling downhill. And so the, the whole idea though is just outreach is what matters. Fair use can't be like harassment or malicious intent. If you make five or six videos where you have taken other people's copyrighted material and you're trying to use it as fair use, YouTube is absolutely not going to accept that. If you've done that to someone, you might want to be nice in what you say about them because that person can take your channel away at any time. Pretty much if you've done something like that, you probably want to basically suck that person's dick in terms of what you're saying about them because your channel now exists at their leisure. That person can basically at that point, if with 15 minutes of typing and hitting the right forms, have your channel shut down permanently. Even if you feel it's fair use, YouTube's only going to let you file one or two and at the very most three uh, fair use policy claims against someone. They see anything beyond that. If you've taken more than about that much, and sometimes they don't, won't even give you that much, if you've taken that much of someone else's video, they're going to see it as harassment and rightly so. Now, you could take a business that puts up such signs and you have the right to boycott that business. You have a right to tell other people to boycott that business because you don't like them imposing uh, their beliefs on you about firearms. And in fact, I'm going to say that if he can't handle trolls, man, he needs to walk away from YouTube. I don't let the trolls deter me, and I get trolled harder than he does. And I just don't give a fuck. Now, another place where free speech doesn't apply is on private property. Uh, case in point, people bring up our YouTube channels. You know what? That's a business. The YouTube wall is an extension of my business. I therefore have the right to remove any person who is saying something offensive. If I don't like it or it's disruptive to the business, I have a right to ask them to leave. If they don't leave, I call the police and the police can show up and arrest them. In this case, I have the police button. But at any private business, if uh, my channel were a shop front or I open a shop front associated with the business and a person comes in saying something I find offensive, your free speech doesn't apply on private property. That person can immediately demand that you leave, and if you don't leave, you're now trespassing. Well, if you happen to be in Texas and it's private property and you're trespassing and you don't leave immediately, you can shoot that person. I was a paid fiction writer on the internet. The problem is that this book company requires everyone who works with them to sign NDAs. I can't discuss the book company. I can't discuss the material. I can't discuss any of the names involved publicly or I violate that NDA and they could sue me. As a result of that, a lot of people are like, oh, they're trying to spam this stuff on my channel. I had been advised by a lawyer that if any references to this thing come out, that I'm covered as long as I delete it. But a lawyer had advised me a while back that they wouldn't be able to take me to court as long as I make a reasonable effort to remove any references to it on any pages I run because technically uh, NDAs, slander violations, things like that, if they're on a media that you host or you own, and in this case my Facebook page and my YouTube channels, 
uh, would constitute media that I run or own. So as long as I make a reasonable effort to remove any such things, I'm covered. I've actually covered myself. It's not my fault that the book company wasn't able to secure their stuff enough for people to not find out who I was over time. I don't know how it got leaked or how any of that happened, but I'm just having to clean up the mess a little bit. It means I'm blocking people. So guys, if I block or ban you for that, it's not because I'm annoyed by you. It's nothing personal against you. Please don't take it the wrong way. I'm covering my butt in court because I kind of have to. I've been advised by a lawyer to delete and ban anyone who does that. I'm not going to court so that you guys can have some fun. But again, because of the nature of it, I can't ever list the book company. I can't list any of the topics. I can't list any of the people involved because it's an NDA violation. And any of you who mention any of that stuff on my media, I have to delete it. I've been advised by a lawyer to do so. And again, it's not personal. I'm not upset with you. It really is amusing, but I still have to ban you for it. So please don't take offense if I do that. It's just something I have to do for legal purposes. Because when people say, hey, Jason, the videos are going to shit. I don't like the comments you're covering. You're kind of to blame. Because if you want to see certain topics brought up or me to do certain types of content, you need to talk about that content in the comments. That's what I'm looking for. And I'm going through trying to filter out all the nonsense and the bullshit. So if you're not posting about the things that you want videos on, you're the only one to blame if I'm not actually posting videos about what you want to hear discuss the topics you want me to do videos on. I'm more than happy to do it that way. I've always done it that way. And please don't talk about all the trolling and the other negative stuff if you don't want to get banned on the channel because I'm going through just picking that out with keywords without even reading the post because I there's so many of them right now. I've banned probably 300 people in the last two days. Still are making videos every single day and we're laughing at all these trolls and shit. We don't get butt hurt about it. We don't give a fuck. Fuck them. At least they're watching us. At least we're making money off them watching and commenting. Fuck them. And anyone who utters any of the key phrases that the trolls are using, we just ban without having to read all the comments. So we, I'm not even seeing what they're saying. And 95% of those are going to be legitimate trolls. And a few people are going to get caught in there. And what I would remind you guys, if you guys know there's a bunch of trolls spamming the page and blocking up the content and the questions and the dialogue that everyone is having where we can get real discussions going on real topics... If you're discussing these things as they're discussing, you're kicking up their key phrases, you're getting caught in there, you're getting banned off the channel. But you need to understand that's not personal. You kind of did that to yourself because you have to realize when I get that many people that I need to ban every day for the exact same comments. So if you're repeating their key phrases or asking questions specifically about what they're talking about, you're just getting caught in the algorithm and you're getting banned without me seeing your comments. And you should know that's going to happen. People talk smack about me, but the thing is when every time they write, oh, this mouth breathing, fat, autistic virgin, he, I can't believe he has a following. Fuck him and his sorry ass. Every time they do that, someone sees my name who's never heard of me they go look they come to, to my channel or my websites to make fun of me and then a bunch of them stay and see the content they, they kind of stick around they see some of the other content and I hear this all the time from people hey I really thought that that was true then I started watching uh, what you have and I realized you actually have some good useful content I started using it and it helped me if you were to come on a YouTube channel and call someone a fat fucking faggot pedophile if they're not actually medically fat that's slander if it's intended to be hurtful. If they can prove they're not actually fat, that's actually slander. That's not protected speech in any court. Because you use the word fucking, it's now obscenity. That's not protected speech either. Because you call them a faggot, if they're not homosexual, that's slander. And it's going to fall under obscenity. And if they're not actually a pedophile and there's no evidence of it, that's also a slander again. So none of that, not a single word in that phrase is protected speech. And if you did it on private property, such as a YouTube channel or a Facebook page, their private business, it doesn't matter what you say, it's still not free speech. So telling lies about other people publicly, and that could include in comment section of a video, uh, it could include any publication, it could uh, include any situation in which the rumor is then going to be spread around, that is actually slander. And in many cases, that is not protected speech, and you might actually be required to pay them damages. Those people are making you money. Love your haters. Your haters are amazing. Don't ever get mad at them. They are for internet business and, and anything to where you need outreach on the internet. Those people are your lifeblood. Those haters will make you rich. Love them. But if someone jumps up and makes an offer and says I'm a coward or a pussy if I don't accept their offer, don't link it to me. If someone says something negative about me or my girlfriend or tells people that it's okay for their fans to slap my girlfriend's ass and encourages them to come do it at my gym or any such nonsense, if you link any of that, I'm going to ban you. 
The other thing I made a public announcement the other day because this person causes more drama than anyone else in the community. Their fans are the worst drama causers and trolls out there, and that's Jason Genova. I've kind of removed any videos where I've stood up for him, any videos where I've interacted with him. I'm never going to mention him again. As far as I'm concerned, he doesn't exist. So anyone who says his name or any of the other names for him or calls themselves a piss trooper or an Order 66, I'm just going to hit the ban button. I don't care who you are at this point. Any mention of this individual tends to cause drama and trolls to appear. It's like a magnet for them. So if I want to keep the trolling and the drama down, anyone who discusses him or even probably watches his channel probably needs to go. So in order to keep the drama low on the channel, I'm going to have to remove the people who ag on the drama. That's the best way for me to do it. Do things to get attention that's going to make you hated. The more that people hate you, the more it increases your outreach and the more money that you're going to make in the long term doing this. And so what I recommend to all of you trying to get into this, this sort of market, if you want to make an actual living at it, it is important that you capitalize on that need to hate within our community. I don't have time to read all those comments, guys. I'm just picking out key phrases and ban, ban, ban down the road. Because that's the only efficient way to deal with that. It's just a very efficient way to deal with the problem without having to deal with the bullshit and drama around it. Just make it all disappear. Not losing sight of who you are as a people or as a species or what it is to be a man. People don't understand things like that anymore and then they wonder why we have a generation of little whiny sissies who need safe spaces and get their feelings hurt instead of being men. They've lost touch of it because they've lost touch of their roots. We don't teach men to be men anymore. No, I'm not actually bald. I wish I was. It would save me a lot of effort. I spend probably 10 minutes every single day rerunning the razor back over my head. I didn't actually go bald. <laughs> I actually shave my head every single day. <laughs> it's almost a game changer for people who hate doing an hour of uh, low intensity cardio. It's an absolute game changer. There, my girlfriend's trying to zoom in on my head so you guys can see I have stubble there that I don't actually, that I'm not actually bald, that I actually shave my head, but who cares at this point? I'm technically not bald, and people will say, oh, that's being defensive. You are bald. No, I'm trying to be bald. Sorry about that, had a neighbor's truck there. I'm a bald wannabe. I shave my head because one, I think it looks better, it's easier to maintain, and I have bad psoriasis. And by shaving my head, it keeps the psoriasis off my scalp so I don't get big lesions and stuff that bleed on it. Hair doesn't work for me on my scalp. I inject testosterone, hoping that it will make me bald. In fact, I'm starting to wonder if I'm not adopted or if my mother wasn't adopted because her father was bald. And so, and he started going bald in his early thirties. I'm 39 and I'm still not bald. I have a little bit of thinning hair. I'm not bald. I'm trying to be bald. I want to be bald. So I'm actually just a big fat one wannabe baldy. I can't even be bald. I'm failing at it. So I have to use a razor. I'm trying guys. I'm pinning testosterone. I'm trying to make my hair fall out and it's not falling out. It would save me a lot of trouble shaving. So in the meantime, I just keep shaving it. So technically I have a shaved head, not a bald head. Am I actually fertile or not? So I went and bought a sperm test, which I researched a bit to see how accurate it is. And we'll check out the results here in a bit. And let's find out if I actually am capable of fathering children right now. Is the timer ready yet? Um, yes, exactly now. Exactly now. So let's take it out the moment of truth. It is, the control line is bright, so we know it's an accurate test, and we are negative. So, get that on the camera, see the control line is bright, and the other line is completely gone. It says even a faint line is a positive, just could be lower than normal, but still in the range. But I am negative, so technically, I guess my drug combination has pushed my sperm count too low to be actually fertile. So it's either at that level or all the way at zero, somewhere in that range. Woohoo! <laughs> because my psoriasis is so bad that if I don't deal with it, I, I shed like a snake. And when I mean shed like a snake, I'm talking it's fucking gross. If I go several days without shaving it, I can grab my skin and pull and peel 
and I can peel sometimes three inch strips of dead skin off my scalp. Um, that's the only reason I keep my beard this short is the same reason I love having a long beard. Like I would have a beard down to here if I didn't have psoriasis, but I've got to tidy my beard up frequently for the same reason I get strips of dead skin like two and three inches long that you can just peel off like a big chunk of dandruff uh, if I don't do it. I have suffered my entire life with inner ear issues. My eardrums blew out from infections when I was four years old and I was deaf for the next three years. So from the age of four to seven, I was deaf. I got my hearing back in my right ear and then I had surgery in my left ear when I was 13 to restore my hearing. So several of the bones, the stipes, and my eardrum in my left ear are completely artificial. I also developed Meniere's disease in my left ear later in my teens because most people who develop disease eventually do develop it in both ears. For me, it took about 15 years for it to go to my other ear. Uh, after just having it in one, I functioned just fine with one, one ear. Uh, when it went to both, it became seriously debilitating. So it's about fluid retention in your ears. I was able to function extremely well, despite having this issue, until I got into my early 30s. And then my condition exacerbated. When it spread to my right ear and it went bilateral, they got so bad that for a good period of time, I couldn't walk without getting vertigo attacks. It would drop me to the floor. Or a lot of times I would get up and try to walk across a room and they would get so bad that I would actually vomit. And I ended up spending something like 10 months in bed because of this. And during it, I had a three year period there to where I was not allowed to train. I had to take four years away from training, somewhere between three and a half and four years. Um, due to illness and inability to train, uh, being fully, fully medically disabled. And I spent 10 months of that pretty much bedridden. And as far as what I still have, yes, I still get vertigo drop attacks. I sometimes do fall down when I'm walking. I occasionally fall down the stairs of my flat, which is fine because I've got enough muscle for padding and they're all carpeted. So it's not that bad if I end up taking a tumble down the stairs. I have about 50% hearing loss. And I have undulating hearing, so I tend to miss about every fourth word people say. So I've had to become very proficient in lip reading. I have continual tinnitus, so I have a ringing in my ears, and it's in both ears that never goes away. And I have no sense of balance medically. So I'm not supposed to be able to walk in a straight line, but as long as I can see, I can do so. But if I close my eyes and I try to stand up, I'll eventually fall down. I actually medically have no sense of balance or motion at all. So I can't feel my head turning right now, other than the muscles moving. I had three different streams of income that I was able to make a living doing while laying in bed sick so that I could continue to survive because it took me two years of fighting in court before I won my disability at the time when I was really, really sick. I had to survive, I had to pay my bills. And the things that I realized, there are different triggers for this disease for different people as far as uh, vertigo attacks and your drop attacks that drop you to the floor vomiting and with the room spinning like you're drunk, they're random, there is no cause. When you think you found a cause for it, it's just a correlation you've made up in your head. Oh, maybe a certain sound place, and that fucks me all up, or whatever. Um, for me, I would say the biggest triggers are stress and not getting enough sleep. That was one of the things I noticed. Uh, or a rapid change in ear pressure. Like if I'm riding in a car and somebody cracks a window, I am totally fucked. Um, <laughs> I tell my friends and family that just straight up. If you crack a window on me when I'm riding in a car going fast, it's going to be so painful for me, I'm probably just going to draw my gun and shoot you. Let's just get that clear right now. Um, <laughs> I, and I make that clear because, yeah, if someone's causing you intense physical pain I, with an action of theirs, I think shooting them might be pretty reasonable. That might stand in court. But that being said, the joking aside there, but not really. Um... And also since inner ears and sinuses are linked together, I've also had sinus problems my whole life. And so a lot of times when you guys hear that heavy breathing that I'm doing, it's because I struggle to breathe through my nose. And so you're hearing me re-breathe through my mouth to catch my air after talking sometimes. As most of you know, I got really, really sick. My doctors told me I couldn't train for about four years and I didn't. I was sedentary for four years in my early 30s. I spent an entire year in bed, and when I got out of bed, I had to learn to walk again. My doctors told me I wouldn't walk without a cane ever again. They told me I'd probably never lift weights again. Well, I started lifting again. I got permission to compete in powerlifting. After the doctors told me I couldn't walk again, I wanted to squat 500 pounds raw again without wraps. I've done that on camera for you guys more than once now. 
And I just wanted to compete again to prove my doctors wrong and to prove to myself that I could come back from a fall that hard. I'm not supposed to be able to function as well as I do according to all of my MRIs and laser balance tests and everything my doctors have done. I function about 10 times better than every single test says that I should be able to. And it's not that my medical condition has improved, it's that I have just fought back hard enough against it to overcome it and just deal with it despite having the problems. This is a disease that absolutely devastated my life at one time. And I know there's been a lot of scuttlebutt on the internet and people have even tried to create videos explaining how they're convinced I don't have it or whatever doctors they, people claim to be doctors try to post. Look, your internet diagnoses mean absolutely nothing. Um, I've had three different specialists, three different specialists, one ENT, I'm sorry, two ENTs, one of them who was the head uh, of the ENT department at Ben Taub Hospital and a neurologist. All three of them gave me separate independent diagnoses for having bilateral Meniere's disease, having it in both ears. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to take the word of three different medical specialists over any jackass or fucktard on the internet. You guys know nothing, absolutely nothing. Um, my medical records are pretty clear on this one. I have been debilitated by it in the past. I spent 10 months pretty much in bed as a result of it. Uh, I had to take years away from training. And contrary to, again, the rumors out there, I do not receive any medical disability for it currently. I do not receive any uh, government money at all. Like, as of right as at this moment, I do not receive a single penny of any type for disability, welfare, benefits, nothing like that from any government in the world. None. Zero. And I pay full taxes on everything that I make. So let's get that, that clear. I'm not faking some disease to get welfare. My medical diagnosis is very, very clear, and I don't receive any welfare from it. No disability currently, nothing. Now, a lot of people are going to point out, well, you know, you've got the lactose intolerance issue, yeah. And people who are really lactose intolerant, like me, I can't drink milk. Most protein shakes give me diarrhea also. They give me gas and diarrhea as well. I'm lactose intolerant. I can't drink milk. I can't drink milk. Heart disease, unless you were born with a congenital heart defect like I was, and my heart health is still perfect in spite of that defect, which kills every single man in my family. My cardiologist is always thrilled when they see my results, even when I was on extremely high doses of steroids when younger. My blood work always came back good and my heart health was good by my cardiologist, even with the heart defect. I made a video telling you guys I was probably not going to compete in powerlifting again due to a possible medical issue, the same thing that killed my mother. I didn't go into all the details, but there's a heart issue there. And it turns out my sister and I both have the gene for that same heart issue that killed my mother at age 48. And accordingly, having looked into it, I've been advised medically that I need to avoid things like really high rep squats and possibly really high rep deadlifts. I can do a lot of higher rep upper body work, but those things I need to avoid maxes, which I do, and I need to avoid the really high rep fatiguing ones that push me to the limit. I'm also avoiding hit cardio. You guys have noticed I do mostly list cardio these days. Remember I told you guys I do an hour of lists every day these days? That's to improve my cardiovascular health and to keep my heart stronger overall. And you guys have noticed I've changed my training in a lot of ways. I keep my intensity pretty high, but I don't hit maxes and I keep my volume somewhat in check. The thing is, guys, this challenge of me trying to do 100 reps with like 315 on the squat could possibly kill me. It could cause my actual aorta to rupture. And even people with legitimate medical conditions, there are people who have conditions out there that will prevent them from reaching their goals, but sometimes those are just excuses. I myself carry a legal disability status according to the US government of 100% disabled. I'm not supposed to be walking without a cane. I'm not supposed to be standing without a cane. I'm not supposed to be training as heavy as I do, and you guys see what I do. I am medically forbidden from doing some of the things that I do. There are no excuses. You own your results. If you want them bad enough, you will find a way to make it happen. As you guys have to remember, I am hearing impaired, and I was actually deaf for several years as a child, and even my other illness is still inner ear related that I had that put me in bed. So, uh, and people aren't aware of that, but I read lips. I can't always hear everything that's said even in YouTube videos, so I am actually reading lips when I watch other people's YouTube videos. So just for the aware. I have about 50% hearing loss and I have fluctuating undulating hearing. 
so I miss about every third word. So I mispronounce things, it's just the way it is. And it's just something I've had to deal with most of my life. And as far as the cardio, because I probably need additional cardiovascular support as a result of, again, a congenital heart defect that I have. Okay, let me make this clear. I am very, very quiet about my background. I don't discuss my background, my full history. Most of you are not gonna be able to find my background. There are people in this industry who have dug it up. It's not a pride thing. It just is what it is. Now, a lot of you guys know because people have pulled my background that I have a bit of a clandestine background. Some of that did come out when Lane and other people sued me that yes, I have worked as a mercenary in the past abroad. I actually know something about advanced interrogation techniques. I used to do snatch and grabs and interrogate people out in the field as a contractor years ago. And I'm not gonna go into the details, but yes, I have killed armed men in my life. That's nobody's business, that's my own background. And it's not something I, I wanna brag about or talk about. It's not an internet hard ass thing. And in my experience, Hajis can't even fight anyways. You guys suck at combat in a country that I'm not going to discuss the name of and not going to discuss any of the people involved, I observed a fairly lightweight person who was hit at around 300 yards twice with a green tip. The first time he was hit, he was riding atop of a donkey and he was hit in the torso and he fell off the donkey, hit the ground. He then stood up and picked up his AK-47 that he was holding and chambered around. I don't care what the rules are. I have my CHL. I carry anywhere and everywhere I want to. Um, and my viewpoint is if I have it concealed and it's concealed well enough, no one knows that I'm carrying. No one knows what building I entered into. No one knows where I went with my weapon. If they don't see it or see printing or something going on to where they can determine that I'm armed. Same thing, I lived in the UK for three and a half years. I couldn't legally own a gun there. Now I'm not saying I might not have acquired some, I'm gonna just leave that one alone. The reason a lot of us who have that mentality who you think are hiding behind guns, no, it's because we take violence seriously. A lot of people are like, you just sound trigger happy. If I was trigger happy, guys, I've been shooting since I was six years old. I started shooting competitively when I was 12. I'm 39 right now. I own a lot of firearms. I am always armed. If I was as trigger happy as you people seem to think I am, where's the trail of bodies all around me? Everyone knows I walk around armed and I've told people repeatedly if they come up and punch me, I'm going to kill them. If anyone comes up and makes a physical assault at me, that I will kill them dead at their expo. Non-negotiable. My first handgun was a revolver. It was a 357 Magnum. You know, I grew up shooting bolt action rifles and uh, lever action rifles. Other than a Ruger 1022. You know, but I got into obviously a lot of tactical weaponry early in my adulthood. You better put some thought into how you're going to respond to this and how you're going to be prepared to deal with those emotions. Because I can tell you how I would deal with it. But I can also tell you that the overwhelming majority of people, they do not have the background or the skill set to successfully stalk somebody, get away with it, dust their tracks, leave no alibi, leave no real forensic evidence and how to set it up to make it look like somebody else did it with a completely different motive. They're emotional, they attack in anger. And if that's the case, you will get caught. So, I'm gonna recommend that you do not try to go after this person. I've briefly mentioned before that I am retired. However, the nature of my retirement is a private legal matter between myself and the United States government. It's actually a sealed court document it isn't public knowledge, it isn't publicly available records. It is something I had to reveal to the British courts here over the lawsuit stuff, but because of the nature of it, the US Embassy told me that if the individual who does have a YouTube channel, who press charges in court against me, reveals any of the small amount of information I release, they will probably prosecute him for criminal charges inside the United States because the little bit of details that I revealed is not supposed to be public knowledge. So he could actually, he would actually be breaking the law if he even published any of it. Yes, I have a classified background. Yes, I have non-disclosure agreements. So technically anything that anyone finds about me 
if they get a hold of it, it's illegal for them to have it. If they spread it around, they're guilty of espionage. So, Simon, if someone sent you any rumors of what the fuck I used to do, and you spread it around, you will go to prison for the rest of your fucking life. And so will the people who gave you the information who got a hold of shit they're not supposed to get a hold of. No, I don't talk about my past because I used to work in intelligence. I worked in intelligence until I cracked under the stress from the PTSD, and then they terminated me and told me that if I ever talked about specifically what I did, that I would spend the rest of my life in prison. So yeah, I'm a little bit fucked up. I'm a little bit crazy. And no, I was never in the military, but that doesn't mean that I didn't serve my country. That doesn't mean that I never risked my life for my country. It doesn't mean I never killed for my country. You think killing people's fucking funny? Well, I can tell you that everyone I know who's ever killed anybody, myself included, from the moment you kill your first person, you're pretty well fucked in the head for the rest of your life. I still have nightmares about the, the first time I killed somebody. I still remember his brain's fucking blowing out everywhere. And that shit is shit that I see in my dreams still to this day. Because I know that you can't provide security that has the same level of training that I have. And for those who don't understand, I trained at the farm at Langley. Anyone who knows what that is knows what that means. You can't provide security capable of providing the security I can provide for myself. Non-negotiable. I don't see knives as a primary self-defense weapon under any condition. Uh, I am trained in knife fighting. Not like you guys are thinking of Kung Fu knife fighting, but actually real fighting with a knife. I am trained in them, but the purpose of a knife, of any training that I have, is uh, twofold. One, to dispatch unarmed attackers. So hand-to-hand -hand combat to give you an advantage against someone who's unarmed and basically to kill people quietly. So to, again, kill forward scouts, kill guards, things like that, without them being able to make any sound. That's what all of my knife training is. And it's, it's so weird that people bring this up because uh, do they live in some world where they think it's illegal to shoot someone just because they're unarmed? For example, let's say I'm in a parking lot putting my groceries in my car. There's security cameras so it can catch everything that's going on. So all of this is going to be seen by a grand jury. All of my physical actions. And someone starts approaching me aggressively. I turn towards them. I'm going to get that powder poured. But I turn towards them and I put my hand up and I say, Hey, you need to back the fuck up. You're making me uncomfortable. That is a universal sign. That gets seen on camera. Me basically commanding them to stop, coming back on my heels, me taking a defensive posture and putting my hand up and saying something to them caught on the camera. What happens when they continue to advance directly at me? If you have a good lawyer, the way the law is written in Texas, and I draw my Glock 19 when they continue to advance, and I put four shots in their chest, blah, blah, blah and they're still standing, can I shoot him again? Yes, I can shoot a fifth shot. What happens if he goes down and he starts trying to reach inside his clothes or his pants and I see a bulge in there? It could be a gun. Any idea? This He could be legally unarmed. He could be unarmed. I don't know that. I see a bulge in there that looks like a gun and the camera sees him squirming and moving still. And I state to, again, the grand jury, the jury, my police testimony, that I thought he was reaching for a gun, even though he was down on the ground with five rounds of federal HST in him, and I shoot again. And with a good lawyer, that's still self-defense. I thought he was reaching for a gun that I thought I saw a bulge in his clothes. He was digging through his clothes trying to get something out. He didn't stop moving. I felt my life was now in danger. Even though he was technically unarmed and wounded, if I can convince the jury that it was reasonable for me to continue to feel in danger at that point because I thought he was reaching for a gun. That's a defense against prosecution. They have to find me innocent. So this idea of, oh, you can't shoot someone because they're unarmed is absurd, it's illogical, and it's flat fucking stupid. You put your hand on your gun. Hey, you need to back the fuck up. You're getting too close. If they continue, you draw. If they take one more step, you are legally justified, at least where I live, drawing, putting around. And it happens that fast. So you have three seconds to get your weapon out and start firing, or less. 
There are scenarios I'm going to run here later with some uh, friends of mine. I've got some ex-Special Forces guys and things. I may run some scenarios with you, you guys to see later. And some of that will be interesting. You guys can see how fast some of these things happen. Well, there's a lot of stuff going on on the internet saying that I claim to be an agent of specific agencies. I do not name government agencies. That is something you will not see me ever talk about on the internet. So it's weird that people have brought that up. I've stated I work as a mercenary and as a private military contractor. Now, what that means, you guys can draw your own conclusions. It's not something I'm necessarily proud of. It's not something I brag about. And the reason I don't brag about it is because it makes me, in a way, feel like a weak person. Because my father, who was a Green Beret and is a self-made multimillionaire, and again, people can dig that up themselves. Some people have dug that up. It's not bullshit trained me for that role and he made me do it and I wasn't strong enough as an 18, 19, 20 year old man to stand up to my own father. I have not been a spy. I've never claimed to be a spy. I've never claimed to be a member of any government agency anywhere on earth. I grew up a hunter. I grew up a competitive shooter and a hunter. I hunted since I was six years old. I shot since I was six years old. I started doing long distance rifle shooting in competition when I was 12 years old. So we'll call it a hunter. I was a hunter of exotic game, if that will make you guys feel better. And a pretty good chunk of the game that I hunted was a very dangerous type of game that did some sort of masonry or bricklaying because they stacked bricks of some type up. So yes, I became a man at the start of the Clinton presidency. I was scouted out for certain types of work before I even finished high school. Again, due to my family, my upbringing, connections certain members of my families might have had along with my shooting skills. Again, I was shooting very successfully at a thousand yards as a teenager, well before I was an adult, in actual competitions. So it isn't far-fetched that I may have been offered certain types of employment at that point. And men weren't even always paid cash because the truth was this was a very competitive market, a competitive environment. It was very dangerous. And there were other things worth more than money for people who wanted to stay in this line of work. Training and hardware. Those things were worth their weight in gold. We got worked. We got worked hard and sometimes we got broken. But I'm one of the lucky ones and I survived. So those of you who don't believe any of this, that's okay. I really don't give a fuck. I'm still telling my story. This is... This is what it is, and if you don't believe me, fuck you, go fuck yourself, I don't care. For all these guys who are veterans who are standing there still screaming about your valor, stolen valor, after what I just told you, that that sounds like I'm stealing any of your valor, you know what, fuck you, kid. You can go fuck yourself, I don't really care what you think. But I will tell you this, if you decide that you're going to come confront me physically about it, you better not be a fucking pog. You better be a stone cold killer. If you come at me aggressively, voice raised, negative body language as someone who I know is a trained killer. Because I don't flinch anymore when I hear a rifle round come by my head. When I hear that whoop and that snap of that sonic boom. I haven't flinched in 20 years from that shit. I got over that a long time ago. So if you come at me, I want you to know, son, it's not going to be me who goes in the ground. I'm still here. I'm still upright and drawing air. And I can assure you I never, ever said anything about being an assassin. I didn't go into any details at all about what sort of work I did abroad or who I even worked for. Furthermore, I have no recollection and I do not recall having ever known of anyone performing an assassination. In fact, I don't even recall what countries I may have worked in in the past, what I did or who paid me. I have purchased four new firearms this year that required background checks. The people note when they do my background checks that mine come back faster than just about anybody they've ever seen. And the reason for that is I actually have a file at the FBI. They keep a file on me and because I have easy to access data for them, I get auto cleared really, really fast. It usually takes about 30 seconds for my background check to go through. Uh, my psychological records, they have full access to all my... <laughs> and because I've previously had security clearance and I have a completely clean criminal record, I have never been arrested. I've never gotten a speeding ticket on record, nothing like that. 
that it's for me it's easy to pass in fact i qualify for class 3 weapons easily i can pass the background checks to get suppressors short barreled shotguns fully automatic weapons i have no trouble qualifying for these things legally so when i talk about the background checks i'm not worried about myself i am way in the clear i can get anything i want not a problem and that's what we saw in the the paris things the france thing and we even saw that in the nice thing some people said well what good would a gun do against a truck well that was out on the street I keep my car parked on the street. I keep an AR-10 rifle in the trunk of my car. I could take the engine block out with that. I have 25 rounds in the magazine of an ammunition that will punch through an engine block, that will go right through a windshield, that will go right through a windshield on a guy wearing Kevlar and still go through his Kevlar on top of that. I keep that in my trunk. A lot of Americans do. A lot of Texans keep that level of firepower handy. It's perfectly legal here. Plenty of us know how to use it. Yes, I would have had the ability had it happened going down a street where my vehicle was parked on the side of the road at an event, I could have probably stopped the attack. So, and someone else pointed out today, well, you know, you carry a nine millimeter in your car and so you wouldn't be much match against the terrorists of AK-47s. Well, I guess I suppose that depends on how much training I have. I shoot a lot, guys. I shoot a lot these days. Uh, it's not uncommon for me to shoot 300 plus rounds every single week. And I spend an hour a day making bullets no matter what. You know, and just like I had a rumor come down to me, probably a joke that, you know, uh, some group force hand had hired a street gang to kill me. They put a hit out on me. I'll be more than happy to kill those people when they show up. Um, they might be biting off more than they can chew. Because all I do is make ammo and shoot guns all day. Not exactly the type of person you're going to try to do a drive-by on. Not going to be the, in your best interest. Not going to be in your best interest to try to draw down on somebody like me. But, you know, it's cool, guys. Come on with it. When confronted in a physical conflict, I'm going to go from zero to a hundred immediately. So it's in my best interest, because I like to avoid court if possible, to completely avoid all conflicts because I know that I'm going to shoot someone who I feel is a physical threat to me and I'm not just going to shoot them one time because I'm a public figure I get a lot of threats I get other people who want to fight me want to attack me because I put out a certain mindset out there people don't know if I'm crazy or not they don't know if I'm actually ape shit nuts or if I'm putting on a front or an act but what they do know is that I have publicly stated that I will shoot anyone who attacks me they also know that I have a lot of weapons and that I train on them so that being said the probability that anyone who maybe doesn't like what I do, they see me on the street, they are planning on showing up at my gym or my home and assaulting me has just dropped to zero. Nearly zero. Only the really, really crazy determined attackers are going to do so. Any of the various YouTubers and public figures who said, oh, they're going to knock me out or hit me or whatever it is that they do, the chances that any of them are going to even consider it now has dropped to zero. They know I know how to use a weapon. They know that I'm proficient with my weaponry and that I have an aggressive mindset with them. So even if they're relatively sure I'm bluffing, they're not going to risk it. Any of the guys who Jerry Ward sicked on my girlfriend, who a lot of them probably consider, yeah, I could go to his gym and slap his girlfriends behind and do whatever I want and nothing's going to happen. She might press charges, but it'll be so funny. I'll get it on video. Any of them who are considering that are now going to have to consider that my girlfriend is very possibly going to shoot them in the face. Nobody wants to slap some girl's ass bad enough to die for it. And then he made a public statement giving people permission on his Instagram last night to slap my girlfriend's ass. He's letting his whole audience know that it's okay to grope and sexually assault my girlfriend in front of me. And he claims that there will be no force used against him for it legally. Well, I think you might want to recheck Texas laws. My girlfriend called her lawyer this morning and that's not going to fly well. So when she shoots one of these guys who gropes her physically, you'll be getting sued afterwards, Jerry. You might want to brush up on Texas law a little bit. I have a sticker on my car with a big Malone lab sticker on the back of my Mercedes. It's on the driver's side. Anyone who's going to walk up behind my car and think about carjacking me, that big sticker, they're going to see it right there. That is going to cut my chances of a potential carjacker down dramatically. So someone said in a comment, Jason, you seem like the type of guy who would similarly take a whole battalion of tanks to a medieval jousting match. And the answer is yes, yes, I would. And why? Because I can defuse the violence that way. 
none of the jousters are going to want to joust against my tanks. All right, guys, I just kind of want to let everyone know what's going on there. People are asking what happened to Expose TV. Yes, I and my girlfriend are responsible for it being shut down. All right, guys, but this is just a start. The wheels of justice turn slow, but I'm going to make sure that everyone involved in this is brought to justice to the best of my ability. Hey, everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and I have something very serious to talk to all of you about. I'm going to try to take this as seriously as I possibly can without laughing. And yeah, this really is serious. I'm not making this up. The police just showed up at my door. I was out running an errand before I came back to train. I was about to come in and do some training. I'll try to get some training footage up for you guys today. Police were waiting outside. We talked about it for a minute and everything's good. I'm not in any trouble, but I want to let you guys know that if you're any of my subscribers or my fans, if you guys would please not contact Lane Norton, please don't threaten him. Don't threaten his family. You're just going to get yourselves in trouble and it just results in the police showing up to my door to let me know that Lane Norton told the police here, I guess, uh, through his, his lawyers or whatever, that those, those threats that people are sending him, they're very intimidating to him. He fears for his life and he fears for the life of his family that, you know, he may be able to deadlift 700 pounds. And he might have a whole catch of assault rifles that he loves to show off online and all his guns and his gun training and his tactical shooting. But he is very intimidated by some of these 15 and 16 year old kids on the internet threatening him. So please stop doing it. Because you are very clearly intimidating and scaring him and he is afraid for his life. But you know, it's really difficult to take something as a friendly offer when a person has made a video which I have kept an original copy of. I have it backed up. I've also given it to my family. I've given it to the FBI and to a lawyer. And for those who aren't aware, you can probably check on it. But yeah, I have filed a lot of stuff with the feds over all these crazy stuff online. And I've handed them 18 gigabytes of data. Now what they choose to do with it's their own business. But the point is, is that I've reported it. Uh, by the way, Jerry Ward, this cell phone will be turned into the FBI later this week. Our text message exchange is going to be seen by them. I'm going to recommend you go ahead and hire a lawyer. You guys, whether you love me or hate me, you are free to believe as much or as little of it as you like. You're free to believe as much of the evidence as presented there is real or fabricated as you like. Guys, it really doesn't bother me either way at this point. This topic is so old and dead that I kind of just don't care at this point. I would rather drink my coffee and train. I got a powerlifting meet in less than three weeks. that I have to finish preparing for. I think I've got the paperwork in order, so it should be okay. And what that will do is give me the ability to have residence in either the US or the UK and go back and forth freely indefinitely without needing a visa any longer. And speaking of this, one reason I've been very quiet about this is because not everybody actually wants this to happen for me. And in fact, someone whose name I will not name has let it slip to several people, including someone who is a very, very big player in the fitness and bodybuilding world who told me personally over the phone that this individual actually hoped that this didn't work out, that I actually get deported. So this person who has never met me dislikes me enough that they think that a happily married couple should be separated by a government by thousands of miles and be forced apart by a government purely because they don't like that person even though they have no reason to hate my wife so it kind of shows you the kind of people who are involved in this industry and this is and that person is actually someone that a whole lot of you out there look up to a lot of you consider a hero it goes to show you what type of people are really involved in this industry now, some advice for you, Vince, because I know that you're going to see this video. This is going to be shared with you. Virgin Gaines doesn't have any money. He may not even be employed. We don't know if he is or not. We know that he lives with his mother. We know that he rides a bicycle. So he doesn't seem to own a home or a car. He doesn't seem to have any meaningful assets. You're going to spend money and not get anything back for it. So what I'm going to recommend that you do if you really want to hurt this kid We've seen him talk a bit about his mom not wanting him to put certain things on the internet. Well, we know he lives with his mother, so she's provided the home where the videos were filmed. She's provided the internet access to where he uploaded the slanderous material, and she probably bought the computer that he used to do it. And that she has seen the work that her son produces. 
So she knows that he's up there slandering people, and so she has enabled him the means to do so. I would recommend that you go ahead and sue his mother instead so that he might actually lose the home that he lives in, and this kid can be out on the street finally. That's what I would advise you to do, Vince. So make sure that you include his mother in the lawsuit. I haven't talked to my father in years, and because of these trolls, um, I had to call my father for the first time in a long time. And honestly, it went a lot better than expected. So I'm starting to get teary-eyed here, guys. I haven't talked to my father in years, and these trolls basically brought my father and I back together. Um, and we had a good heart-to-heart. -heart. We talked about all this, and I just talked to him about what goes on kind of in this business and what I do. We talked a bit about his company and everything, and just talked about life, but we caught up a bit, and... As annoying as some of these trolls might be, and as crazy as it's going to sound, this troll who's dedicated a whole channel to hating me just brought my father back into my life. And we're actually on speaking terms again. He actually talked to me for a bit and then called me back. He had some business to take care of, and he called me back, and we talked another 20 minutes. Um, and like I said, I haven't talked to my father in years. And of course, we, I mean, we did laugh about all of these trolls and everything. And he, he did ask me, is there anything you can do legally? And I mean, I'm like, Dad, these people are nobody. They don't have money. So you guys watch the gentleman's mannerisms, his level of nervousness, looking like he's on the border of a panic attack, scratching his beard, looking nervous. And you guys decide for yourselves. Most of us live in free countries. We have free thought. Think whatever you want. Oh, the other thing is a lot of these people really and truly believe that I made a public attack against Lane Norton and his family and his children. And the truth is I never did. The police investigated that and it actually wasn't me who did it. It was a fake copy of my account that someone used to do it. No matter what else people might think of me, you guys might think I'm the biggest piece of shit in the world, but I promise you that I would never threaten someone's wife and children just because I'm upset with them. But yeah, this is the threat that is being levied at me. People keep trying to say that, well, we have evidence it came from your account. I don't understand the evidence that people are trying to present of that. It never came through anywhere through my Facebook feed that I could see. Now, I will state that I was not the only person who had access to my Facebook login at that time. My ex-wife was a bit emotionally unstable, but I don't think that she would have posted that. So I don't, I don't want to accuse her of that, even though my Facebook had been logged in on three different computers at the house and it was accessible. I honestly and truly don't think she would have typed that either, even in her own instability. So I don't want people to think I'm trying to blame that on her because I, I honestly don't think she would have done that, all things considered. But I know that I didn't type it, and I've never seen any evidence that would lead me to believe that it had, it had been posted from my Facebook account ever. Nothing that would convince me of that that would make me understand that. So I don't even know if there was a hacker involved. I don't know if it was just a clever catfish account, a clone account. There's plenty of those out there. I don't claim to understand what's going on there or how any of that works. All I know is I didn't type it. And I never saw evidence later through my own Facebook account that I had been involved in that thread that it was uh, attributed to. And none of it came through my feed ever. So I don't have an explanation there, but I know I didn't type it. I gave them my word that I will not go to the state of Florida. And it's just ridiculous that you're inviting me there under crazy false pretenses. Um, when you know, I've stated before, I've been told not to do public appearances. Um, I've stated before that I think that you do intend to have me killed. Uh, if, you, if you thought you could get away with it, you would. And what a golden opportunity to get away with it. 
And uh, yeah, I mean, Lane, I'm not stupid. And the reason I really want all of this to come out is not only to have kind of my side of the story told, but also so that people will understand and so that there's a public record of all of this because of the statements he's made and the sheer amount of hatred and things he's said about me recently publicly. If anything happens to me and I am killed, I want the authorities and I want my family and other people to know who to look for as the primary suspect in it. And I want people to know who is financially behind it. And then you went on to create a fake Facebook account after you couldn't collect any money off of me and threaten your own family with it and then immediately run to the police and try to press criminal charges against me, which prompted a police investigation. The police found that I didn't do it, that it was done from the United States, not the United Kingdom where I was living at the time. And I didn't actually threaten your family or any such nonsense. Now, as to the gentleman making the video, a few tips for you. I actually don't know because of the way this has gone down whether these stories about the death threats that you got are actually true or not. I get shit like that all the time, so it's very well possible. I hope none of my fans really did that. If they did and you want to go find the guy and kill him for threatening your son, I wouldn't hold it against you. But don't pretend like I'm responsible for that shit in any shape, form, or fashion. And any fans out there who think that, who think that I'm in some way responsible for that, that's bullshit, guys. That's crazy-ass internet people just looking for someone to send threats to. And I get this shit every day. You don't see me blaming the people who these people are fans of because I get death threats. That's bullshit. And if people sending you stuff on the internet are giving you anxiety attacks, you should probably get off the internet. You're not suited to be a public figure if you can't handle crazy stalkers and crazy people sending you death threats. Again, I deal with it every day. You don't see me having anxiety attacks. If you are, I would recommend that you go get some therapy. Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha. And yes, for those asking, this is the first time I've really made a public statement on this situation, the whole cyber stalking situation and all the felonies that it committed involved with it. Uh, but yes, Exposed TV was shut down this morning, barring a federal investigation, because Exposed TV committed a number of felonies in his cyber stalking of me, ranging everything from forging my girlfriend's signature to impersonating a government official while contacting someone with security clearance, to cyber stalking, cyber bullying, defamation. But yeah, he has been shut down. He will possibly be prosecuted depending upon what information they can find where he lives. But yes, he has been shut down. Uh, as far as the fitness goes, that's the biggest part of this big cyber stalking ring. We're also trying to press criminal charges. And normally I wouldn't give a damn about Jerry Ward's personal life. The guy has publicly admitted he's part of a cyber stalking ring against me. He's publicly said he hates me, all sorts of stuff. Guy is not welcome in my presence. I will consider him an immediate physical threat. Furthermore, Lane, because you've showed that you want me dead, you said you'd pour gas to watch me burn and admitted you hate me. Uh, you are a concealed weapons holder and you also possess NFA items. I know that for a fact. You have items registered with the ATF. Class 3 weaponry. And you've tried to actually harm people I care about. I, I want this public record too. I've said this in the FBI building and I've said it in front of a lawyer. I consider you coming within a half a mile of me ever for any reason to be a potential threat of violence or immediate injury or death. I will repeat that Lane, because of your previous actions, I consider you intentionally coming within half a mile of me or any member of my family to be an immediate threat of bodily injury or death and I will respond accordingly as the state of Texas allows uh, from people claiming that they're going to stalk us in the parking lot of my gym hold me at gunpoint while they gang rape my girlfriend and then they're going to pour gas on us and burn us alive You know what, guys? At 38, it's really nice when I see my other friends, guys I went to high school with, who only have sex once a week. I have sex twice a day. I get the fringe benefits of having great energy, having a great sex drive, having sex twice, sometimes three times every day. 
All right, I'm really not trying to attract women right now because I'm kind of seeing someone a bit. I've actually been turning women away. And on top of that, I'm not really interested in what women think because I'm in a happy monogamous relationship with a girl that I'm in love with who has sex with me every single day. By the time you get to Nick's age, and certainly by the time they get to my age, probably at least half of guys out there have probably had at least one threesome with two girls. In today's age, that's not uncommon. I'm not putting a moral judgment on it. I'm not saying whether that's right or wrong or not. I'm just saying that's the reality of the world that we live in. Um, is it something I'm interested in doing And as I've gotten older? No. Is it something I've done in the past? Yeah. And uh, kind of brings me to another point with that. You know, I've had an ex who was very much into other girls. But I didn't make it everyone's business. I didn't run around telling everyone. I certainly didn't put our names up on social media and throw up photos of us doing stuff together with other girls. Um, now, there are some of the trolls have sent me messages claiming they do have a copy of a sex tape with her, I, and one of her female friends. But... Um, that remains to be seen as to whether they really got a copy or not. Tell them about how we got together and how you took me seriously and everything. Okay. okay, Brittany wants me to chime in here and let you guys know. For example, when Brittany and I got together, um, <laughs> we got together and uh, no, we didn't have sex immediately. I know that's going to sound funny to a lot of people because, again, everyone has views of us. But... Um, we actually were introduced by another friend who I was dating casually, was casually dating, who thought we'd be a good match, and she hooked us up. And uh, no, I slept in her bed, fully clothed, cuddling her for two weeks before we even locked into a relationship or anything. Like, no clothes <laughs> came off or anything. Uh, we took our time with that. But when a guy treats you a certain way, he's not taking you seriously. And guys, by that same token, uh, you need to understand that. That uh, if you're considering anything serious or long-term with a chick and it's more than just fun, you don't treat them like that. Um, you don't treat them like that at all. You don't disrespect them in public that way. My girlfriend needs dick twice a day for me. Of course, I'm going to get asked on stuff like this because I do know a lot about eating drug testing in sports. And it's something I used to do for money was help athletes do this. Like at one time, I was working with up to a dozen university athletes who were subject to random testing and getting them through it. I used to manufacture anabolics and other drugs that I used to actually sell to some of the Texas A&M football team, and I used to help them pass their drug tests. They used to pay me to help them pass their drug tests, uh, students at that university. I'm a grown man. I've been in this game for a very, very long time. I've worked with randomly tested athletes who undergo far more stringent tests than anybody in the natural bodybuilding world has ever undergone. Because of my own life experience, is <laughs> going back to this stuff two decades, um, someone who's even helped college athletes pass their drug tests. I mean, I've helped guys beat drug tests at the university level. I know plenty of guys who've done it at higher up levels I've talked to. And there's a whole industry around it. Yes, I have run an anabolic steroid lab. And yes, I have been paid by athletes to help them through random testing at the university level quite a bit. Actually, over a dozen different athletes paid me to help them with that, who undergo more stringent testing than most of these drug-tested powerlifters do. The fact that we know Saudi Arabia is responsible for 9-11, we've known since 9-11. We know it was paid for by Saudi royal family members. And you know, the thing is, it's really troubling. Why does anyone even think the U.S. government or the Israelis or anyone else are responsible? Because of the online conspiracy movement. Well, um, I've seen the money trail personally, and I've known someone who hands out money for people within the conspiracy movement online. Um, someone who actually pays people, and I'm going to stay out of that, and he was Saudi Arabian. You know, it's interesting that they pump money into the, on the online conspiracy movement, and I know that for an absolute fact. I know that for a fact from personal experience that they do. Uh, and conversations I've had with various people involved in that. All right, the truth is, yes, I have been a paid conspiracy fiction writer on the internet in the past under a pseudonym because I have some unique life experiences, some unique knowledge and understanding of world history, ancient history, things like that, very well read. And I discussed with them an idea of going online for them under a pseudonym and writing fictional material to help them with their book sales. 
And it grew for a while, and I did that for a while, and I was a paid fiction writer on the internet. A lot of us who know world history, who've read battle strategies all through history, see what happens in other countries, those of us who are worldly and knowledgeable, because I'm not an ignorant redneck from Texas. I am extremely well read. I have traveled the world. I have lived around the world. I've spoken to people and met with people in person from countless cultures around the world. I've read history for many, many years, thousands and thousands of pages of history and military strategy, going all the way back and looking even at the strategies from the Crusades and the other previous jihads. Anyone who's well-read and knowledgeable knows what's going on. It's not, it doesn't require you to be ignorant, and I'm not a, just some ignorant Texas redneck. Again, I am worldly. I've read the entire Satanic Bible cover to cover. All right, I've had a big corporate job. A number of years ago, back when I first started getting sick with my Meniere's disease, I realized I was possibly going to reach a point to where I might not be able to do normal work again. Definitely wouldn't be able to do work abroad, might not be able to keep my corporate job. Uh, because this is interesting, and I was reminded of this because uh, an actor I was chatting with a while back. Um, and yeah, that's kind of what we do. Um, when I'm not on YouTube, one of the things that my girlfriend does is she works in film, the film industry. And so we talk to actors and actresses. I was known in the past for very heavily editing my videos. Me sitting down and making a 10 minute video or a 15 minute video and then chopping it down to three minutes. You guys saw all the heavy edits. That's actually what that was. I've done that for a very long time. A lot of people noticed it. And I felt like to me, that was an enormous amount of work. Why sit here and film for 15 minutes to make a three minute video or four minute video and then have to edit it and say things three or four different ways and rethink how I want to say it because then I get all focused on it. And I felt like it hurt uh, the quality of my content and my production value. Sorry, I got interrupted by a phone call in the middle of filming. Which again, guys, this is one of the reasons you see so many cuts. My phone rings and I have so much noise outside where I live. That is another reason I have to cut these videos all the time. I will sometimes have five or six different horn honks from a car outside that I have to clip out in a single four minute video. As you guys notice, I'm in a new place. There's a reason I didn't make videos yesterday, just moved again. I might make a video discussing some of that in the move. One of the reasons I needed to deload, just dealing with the stress of a lot of things. Long story short, the rental agreement that we had made for where I was living at the time, the landlord did not keep their end of the agreement. And it just wasn't a good business situation, so I moved into a new place. I had just moved into a place that I thought we were, I was going to be renting a house for a year. The landlord, I'm not going to get into his personal life, um, but, you know, when people try to treat their PTSD uh, with street drugs and alcohol, it doesn't always work out well. And we had some major issues. The uh, house we were renting, other people started getting moved in without us being consulted about it to rent rooms and things like that. And uh, we had to just get out of there. But the reality is you guys need to understand that it is a business owner's right to do business with whom they please. For example, when I lived in the UK, back when I trained at a powerlifter gym that was owned by an IPF powerlifter, when he found out that I had made a YouTube video saying that I don't have any problem with athletes uh, using drugs in sports. It doesn't bother me. I don't see a moral issue with it. That's just them competing. That's the reality we live in. And if they unbanned drugs in sports, that I wouldn't have any problem whatsoever with it. Me making that statement caused him to say that he didn't want a person like me training at his gym, that he felt it was bad for his gym, and he didn't want someone who was okay with drugs in sports training at his gym. He met me at the front door of it. He handed me my entire month's uh, payment back. I had been going, I'd used about a week of it up for that particular month, and he canceled my contract. And you know what? Rather than be a dick about it, I looked him in the eyes and said, I'm very disappointed. And while I disagree with your viewpoints here, I respect your right as a business owner to decide who you want to do business with. And so I'm not gonna have a problem with that. And I looked him in the eyes and I shook his hand. I think that surprised him a little bit. If all of you want to know how you can help with the juggernaut in a bins, just check the annotations here in this video or go to my Facebook fan page, which is down below, or Twitter, or just check out any of the social media of the other big YouTubers because it's been spread everywhere. And you guys probably realize by now that GoFundMe was just a publicity stunt. I was already being offered quite a good deal on a used Mercedes-Benz by my sister. 
which I purchased from her today. And truth be told, that was really just something I did for fun. It was something my sister kind of came up with and thought it would be really funny for me to do when she was selling me the car, so we did it just for the fun of it. The GoFundMe with the Mercedes Benz. Guys, I can afford the Benz now. It was just a fun publicity stunt. And it worked. It worked. It went viral everywhere. And all these people smack talked to me and all it did was increase my outreach. And it was a fun, funny thing to do. I enjoy doing it just for fun and it increased my outreach everywhere. And that's okay. It's okay to be lazy. Just don't pretend like you're not. Be honest with yourself about your work ethic on something. There are things that I don't enjoy doing that I am lazy at. Like gardening. I hate fucking gardening. What did you want to be when you were a kid growing up? Uh, yeah, I've covered this one before. A school teacher. I wanted to be a school teacher. Yep. What kind of school teacher? I didn't know. I kind of went back and forth on a few different ones. I thought about uh, teaching biology or, you know, even a health course. But I did. I thought about being something like a bio biology teacher. And uh, my father completely shot it down. I was younger. He said, no, that's not going to work. There's no money that you spend a fortune on school and you'll never make the money back. Make the money back. And it's... That's, uh, you know, no, no son of mine is going to do that. Instead of putting in the work, because it's not going to get you anywhere. Just like you don't see me pretending that I want an amazing rose garden out on my uh, balcony. Why? Because I hate doing it, and I'm too lazy to do something that I hate doing. So don't lie to yourself like that. Honestly, my mother wanted me to be a medical doctor. And to me, the idea of doing a full pre-med, full medical school internships and being locked into something like that just seemed so tedious to me that I really wasn't interested because of that. In terms of the, the actual interest in it, yes, I could have been a medical doctor. Yes, I'm intelligent enough. Yes, my mother actually wanted me to become one. Also interesting, I recall in a psychology class I was taking many, many years ago when the professor was asking the men in the class what they thought the research would say that women noticed first on a man's body, what part of his body they noticed first. And the guys gave the typical guesses. The guys were like, oh, the arms, the biceps, and another was like the chest. And the professor said, no, you're all wrong. Any of you know what it was? This was data conducted 15 years ago, and the number one listed body part, or part of a man's body that women noticed first in terms of sexual attractiveness, it was their butt. This is a YouTube channel. I'm not writing any more research papers for professors. I don't cite my fucking sources. I grew up doing charity work at Christmas. My family believed in that. We worked at soup kitchens. We wrapped presents for underprivileged children. That was the kind of thing that my mom made us do before we could open our Christmas presents. That we had to go wrap presents for people who didn't have anything so that we'd be appreciative of what we had. And that was just part of how we were raised and growing up. I've done tons of blood donations for like the MD Anderson Children's Cancer Research Center, things like that. But because he's got neck tattoos and things, where I live, that represents that you're either a gang member, a member of a drug cartel, or that you're like a heroin junkie, or, a, or that you smoke crack or something like that. I can't be publicly associated with people who look like that because I'm trying to do business stuff in the long term where I'm going to need class three licenses, FFLs, things like that. I can't really associate with a criminal element like that or be seen in public with them. And I'm not going to lie, my girl does have a criminal record. Over a decade ago, she did get a deferred felony for distribution of a controlled substance, and in that case, it happened to be cocaine. Yes, my girl danced a bit while she was in grad school. Now, inside the grocery store, probably not that big of a deal. Yes, I have been in a grocery store while growing up that was robbed while I was there, but the jackass had a knife, and they ended up actually tackling him, uh, and a cashier, a really big woman, sat on top of him, <laughs> which was really amusing, but... It, it was definitely a sight to see. I'll never forget that. But that did happen. I've seen plenty of it in my life. I have, uh, again, been around corporate executives and things a few times in my life at the golf course. And um, this sort of behavior is, is normal for them. In fact, I'll give you guys a perfect example before I close this down. Um, I played golf with some well into six-figure salary corporate executives uh, with my dad before. And the rule they had, when you drive the ball out of the men's tee box on the golf course, if it doesn't pass the women's tee box, you have to play the rest of the round with your penis hanging out to prove that you're a man. Now, I did that when I was a teenager. I wasn't even legally an adult, but I had to follow the rules. Because that's the rules, had to prove you're a man. You had to play with your penis out. Because you couldn't hit the ball past the woman's tee box. 
You know, there's always crazy rumors going on out there about me. Some of it's just shocking to me, the things that I see, and I'm just like, wow, this is insane. This is ape shit fucking nuts. Uh, a lot of it blows my mind. Uh, a lot of misconceptions out there. And how much money am I making doing all of this if you take everything from my combined YouTube incomes? Because I've got a couple of different channels. Uh, I have two different affiliates. I've got a Tiger Fitness affiliate. I have an Amazon affiliate right now. I'm also writing one article per month, which takes me a couple hours for Tiger Fitness. Uh, what's my predicted income? For this year, it's probably going to be conservatively, on my taxes this year, 35000 It could be forty or more, depending on how the later part of the year goes, because I'm going to get some additional promotion in here as a result of other outreach. And so if that pans out, it could it could go over forty. Well, and yeah, at the rate I'm going with this year, off the fitness end, I'll probably end up making a hundred grand a year eventually. And of course, I've got my other tactical channel going. I'm going into a tactical company with friends of mine, and that's another niche market that I'm going to be using this to expand upon and to grow the outreach on that slowly. And we're going to be doing uh, gun shows and all sorts of things there, and that's going to build up into a legitimate part-time business on top of it. And you know, maybe in the long term, that'll make a hundred grand a year. If we're cranking out people individuals by the millions from high schools who do not have the ability to be productive members of society, I would say that that is a catastrophic failure of an education system and it's time to scrap the whole thing and rethink what we're doing and start over because we clearly have screwed it up. If we're producing millions of people who have no ability to be productive members of society, we have squandered our money and we've squandered 12 to 13 years of the lifetimes of most of these students. And all things considered, this would be kind of an interesting video considering I'm sitting here actually doing a, uh, you know, a very technical skill here. Uh, I'm reloading ammunition. And he's such a loser. Oh, he's this uh, fat autistic virgin, which is really funny because people who know me in real life will laugh at that. I'm actually really, really social in person and I'm by no means a virgin. And for those asking, I'm not on welfare. I make way too much money. I, I don't qualify for any sort of welfare anywhere in the world. I have four different uh, W-7 and 1044s filed with the IRS. Believe me, I don't qualify for anything. And we're producing students who can do nothing but pass a standardized test that have no skills. Uh, they can't weld. They can't change the oil in their car. They can't rebuild a basic car engine. Um, to me, that's shocking. As someone who grew up in a different environment, uh, the fact that there were 18-year-old young men uh, who couldn't rebuild a simple lawnmower engine if they had to, I find that shocking. I didn't have any friends who couldn't do that when I was younger. All my friends, we messed with stuff like that. We built car engines. Uh, we, <laughs> we loaded ammo. We made our own ammunition. We did things like that. So I didn't actually know other boys who couldn't do those things when I was younger. Just throwing that out there, at least among my circles of friends. Um, so it's kind of shocking that they can't do these basic things. They don't know how to weld. None of them can do basic electronics. But they don't have college degrees either. Uh, what good are these people going to be to society? We are wasting trillions of dollars educating people who can't do shit. They're worthless to society. Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here. And I thought I would just relax work on my little arts and crafts here and I will make a video soon. A few people keep asking me things about why I do these videos like this. A lot of people enjoy them, a few people don't. I'll cover that later. Probably worthy of its own video. Uh, it was partially from advice I got from a PR expert. What am I doing here with this stuff? Why do I do it? Uh, what's my motive behind it? What, what message am I trying to convey? Uh, so let me put on my plus five hat of weaponsmithing. Do a little bit of my crafting and let's talk about it. Uh, part of it is a unique stick. It's a unique stick. And when I do this, it reminds me of my grandfather. And to me, that's very relaxing because when I do this and I hand load, I'm getting teary eyed. Um, I think of someone, my grandfather, who I looked up to and I loved tremendously, who treated me like a son. Um, and it. it Sorry, I'm getting teary-eyed. It just it puts me in a happy place. I feel like Bob Ross painting his happy little trees on camera while talking. Because for me, this is therapeutic. Um, and for Bob Ross, painting was uh, therapeutic. Uh, a lot of people didn't know that about him. Bob Ross was actually a drill instructor in the military. You wouldn't think that uh, with the way that he was just his happy little trees thing. Um, that sells, you know, gunpowder and primers and brass and 
reloading equipment. It's just right there down the street. Um, this is just this is part of my culture. And what it is for me, that would be no different than if you had a British guy who got up and talked every day while making his tea and drinking his tea. Um, that who was very very British. I'm very Texan. All right, a lot of people aren't aware that I haven't been doing training footage lately, and it's not because of anything conspiracy or crazy or anything else like I'm hiding that I'm in a wheelchair. Apparently a lot of people thought <laughs> that we were faking it and I'm sitting down at the gym uh, because I'm in a wheelchair, but that's not the case. Um, I'm clearly up and able to lift heavy weight for reps and uh, pin lay rows and everything else. I'm clearly up and mobile and still plenty strong by most people's standards. Now, people always ask me things like, Jason, why do you do all this crafting and busy work on camera? Uh, well, one, I find it relaxing, and two, it sure has made it impossible for people to chop and screw my videos and make me say things I didn't say, hasn't it, for all you guys who watch these, who do that stuff. You guys having fun with that? Trying to make me say things I didn't say? A little harder now, isn't it? Have fun with that. Have you seen the things that people write about me on the internet and say about me all day? Have you watched the hundreds of videos that are out there that go through great efforts to humiliate me, some of which have gotten over 100,000 views. Do you read the insane shit people write about me every day on the internet? Do, do you honestly think, no seriously, do you honestly think there's anything that you could do that would humiliate me? That there's like literally anything that you could say or do that would cause me embarrassment or humiliate me at this point? Do you think there's anything anybody could say online at this point about me after all the shit that people have said that would cause me a single drop of embarrassment or humiliation? I'm so fucking far beyond that that I don't care. You want to post my dick pictures? Go ahead. I don't fucking care. I mean, what are you going to do to humiliate me at this point? I've been accused of literally so much crazy, embarrassing type, insane shit all day long by so many people online that literally I am completely above embarrassment at this point. Like literally there is nothing that you could say that would embarrass me in any way. Like nothing at all. Like I'm so used to people saying stuff all day that I just laugh at this point. It's fucking crazy. Um, <laughs> just read some of it. Read some of it. My God. Like, I don't think that you can come up with anything better than what people have already put out. Like, it's all been done already. I don't think there's anything left. I spawned a whole economy of people who make probably a thousand or more dollars a month on their YouTube channels talking about me. That's all they do. It's like, dude, seriously. Now, the other thing I would ask too, if you're older as well, if you are older as well, at a high school, and you have all these body composition and muscle gaining goals, and you're still living with your mom, because it's one thing if it's occasionally your mom cooks you a meal, that's fine. But if you're still living with your mom and that's why she's cooking meals for you, I might want to suggest to you that you reevaluate your life goals a little bit. It sounds like you've got more important things on your table that you need to worry about than getting your ideal body composition down. I started my original weight loss journey when I was 19 and it ended after I was well over 20. I, I lived with my mother at the time and a lot of people laugh about that. Well, my family had a lot of money. Believe me, they had plenty of spare bedrooms. This is not an issue. It's not like I didn't have privacy. <laughs> when they, when you live with your family, but they own several houses. All right. And uh, by the way, I'm going to note a few people will come in here and comment, but you live with your sister, your mom, or whatever. No, I haven't. I don't know where any of that came out. Just because Michael Hearn said that, that's no truth to it. I haven't lived with any members of my family in many, many, many years. So <laughs> I don't know where that weird idea came from. Most people who know me are kind of like, I'm a very intense person and it's not that I'm not empathic or all the people on the internet who perceive me differently. I'm not autistic or anything ridiculous like that, but I am a very intense person. However, I do have that intimidation factor and I do come across, especially a lot of other guys as 
very intimidating. I have a presence when I come in a room and that's been told to me by quite a few people that I'm a very intimidating person and I'm very scary in some ways and I have to try to keep that reeled in. But uh, yeah, Jerry, this is kind of ridiculous. It's kind of pathetic on your part, but you know what, man? Make all the money you want off of it. But if I decide that it's my money that you earned, I don't want to hear any crying when I come to collect it. It's just business, nothing personal. But on a side note, you better not ever mention my mother again, you son of a bitch. That is personal. That's not business. I'm going to be nice and give you a warning on that one. And uh, maybe you did that by accident, another one of your heroin and drug-induced hazes, because you have admitted publicly to being a heroin addict. And you know what? Once an addict, always an addict. And if you're an addict, that's a weakness that can be exploited. Remember that. You know, that's what you expect on the internet. Guys, people on the internet are, for the most part, a bunch of big pussies. We like to sit back at a distance and harass people, and, you know, they stalk people, and they even tend to do things to them at their homes and everything. They're intended victims from a distance. But you know what? They're big pussies who are scared to actually confront anybody for the most part. But people like the anonymity of the Internet. They like to be able to sit behind the Internet and attack people, oftentimes with their face, with their name, with their identity hidden, knowing that they're safe. Uh, because that's the world we live in today, unfortunately. Uh, the Internet brings out the worst in a lot of us. Uh, particularly very cowardly people who just want to feel important, they want to feel big. But yeah, I do have this very scary, intimidating streak to me that comes out, and some of it has to do with my perspective, my actual life perspective when it comes to dealing with people who I see as any sort of threat to me or anyone I care about is pretty extreme by most standards. And yeah, people pick up on that, and so certain people, even just private conversations I've had with them, probably think I'm a little crazy, a little bit scary. And I can definitely see from conversations I had with Candido as to why he might have that perspective. And this comes back to kind of the point I always make about the amount of posturing and guys who really want to pretend to be tough guys in this industry when they really aren't. And they're always issuing these physical challenges. And this is the second time this has happened with Mike O'Hearn. I'm not going to go into the behind the scenes what happened, but you guys will notice that Mike was talking about, oh, he's going to come to my gym and run me out of my gym. He's going to do a seminar at my gym because I wouldn't accept his silly ass little challenge. And then he said he was going to slap me. Not going to go into the details of it. He was talked to by other people. And you notice Mike hasn't said my name since, nor said anything about coming to my gym. Because quite frankly, I'm just not interested in being a tough guy or proving that I'm a tough guy. If someone becomes a threat to me or people that I love, I make them go away. And I'll just tell you straight up. Um, <laughs> anyone approaches my girl and hits on them, they might disappear. I'm just going to leave, it out, leave that out there. I don't know what happened to you. If someone becomes a threat to you, whether it's a physical threat, then they have to die. No question about it. You do everything you can to take them down. I don't even want my worst enemies to die of cancer or to have diabetes, because I've seen people die from those things. Me personally, when anyone is my enemy, I don't like them. Do I wish them harm? I wish they get Ebola. I hope every person who is my enemy out there, I hope they get Ebola. And before I go to bed at night, I pray to Nurgle, the Lord of Wrath, that he infects every person who has made themselves my enemy with fucking Ebola. I deadlift over 600 pounds. You think I can't kill you with my bare hands? Think about it. I do come across as the tough guy, the alpha male. Oh, people Watch complain me. about me wearing comic book shirts. Are you okay with that? I'm okay with that. I'm going to slightly upgrade your wardrobe as we go along here. Okay. Comic books don't put you off. As long as you let me dye your beard. But a semi-male version, I guess. He's kind of, I don't know, ambiguous a little bit with all the eyebrow plucking and all that shit. Okay. She's going to dye my beard. That's the next project. She just did my eyebrows. <laughs> She's a stylist, by the way. And those sexy eyebrows right there. Woo! Right, ladies, he's taken. And a lot of you guys do know that I am a super nerd in addition to a number of other things. You know what? When you're a boy, your ego rules you. When you're a man, you rule your own ego. Quite a few people have asked me 
and linked to me the whole Lyle McDonald thing of Lyle McDonald talking about his book where he walks in two worlds and people want my opinion on all of this and people are acting like this is a big deal and a big scandal or a few people are and I'm sorry but to me this is laughable now I think it's fine if Lyle wants to write a book about this that's his prerogative selling points but to call this stuff a dark side managing a strip club working in the porn industry having sex with strippers that's it, that's really your view of a dark side. That's mostly legal stuff. Anybody who thinks that that is a dark side has led a very, very sheltered life. And the majority of people who have a dark side, a real dark side, are not going to talk about it on a video or in a book because they will go to prison or they will get assassinated. That is not a dark side. That's Mickey Mouse kitty shit but if you guys find that sort of thing interesting then by all means check it out And also, I left my Breathe Right nasal strip on that I sleep with at night because of my sinus issues. So hopefully no one comments today, oh, he's out of breath, he's out of breath. No, motherfuckers, I have sinus and inner ear problems. I do two hours of cardio a day right now. The only place I have bad genetics is in my arms and my relatively narrow hips. So I'm going to be experimenting a bit, though, and getting a little more aesthetic because it will improve my outreach. And I've talked to quite a few really legitimate experts out there who do have access to cutting edge data and research. It isn't always publicly available. People who do work with serious bodybuilders, professional athletes, of some of the methods and things that are being used successfully here that not everybody knows about. Now, a lot of this I may or may not make publicly available with what I'm gonna be doing but I will probably at the end go into some details on some of these things because I will be using some methods that are perfectly legal, aren't even banned in natural bodybuilding, and can't be tested for even in the Olympics. Now, all of my mother's friends used to ask me, you know, what's the secret, what's the secret, how have you lost all this weight? And I used to tell them it was just sheer hard work, there is no secret, I just eat better and I exercised till exhaustion and it was just all it took was hard work and me saying that this is the most important thing in my life right now that I have to do this and but the truth of it is that's not true it wasn't that simple the secret was that I accepted personal accountability that I accepted that it wasn't my genetics and I had to accept that it's not my genetics it's not something outside of my control that I and responsible for my obesity that it is my actions my lifestyle my choices that control the results that is the secret when you accept that you are in control you're accountable that what happens is based upon what you do every single day your choices and that was the secret to my fat loss and for some reason, there's people who seem to think that I've never been a bodybuilder. They I always see things online. People say Jason doesn't know how to cut. He's never been had a six pack, never been single digit body fat. And I laugh my ass off because these people are completely unaware of my personal background. I have been 5% body fat before. I fucking hate it, but I've been there. And I do know how to get there. And yeah, that's the type of tricks that I use because I have a voracious appetite. I genetically and naturally have an absurd appetite, but if I go into a very mild ketosis and I pop metformin, my appetite goes away. I don't get hungry anymore. And a lot of people aren't aware, but I have been contest for it before when younger. Needless to say, this hasn't been any time near the last decade, but I have been there. I hate it, would never do it again. Not interested in it. So what I'm trying to do is just push down to the nine to 10% range over time to increase my outreach. So people say, well, maybe this guy actually knows what he's talking about, I should listen to him. So that is the whole point in me getting lean is to improve the outreach of this channel. It will put me in a better position to actually be a voice of authority that younger people will listen to. And the thing is, yes, I'm having to do it slow, 
because I am older, guys, I'm 38 years old, I do have a medical issue that has an autoimmune component, I can't get away with blasting large amounts of gear. And I have to work around the fact that I'm 38 years old with a major medical issue. So there, I can't get away with certain things that a lot of you much younger, healthier guys can get away with to get the same results. So I'm gonna to have to do it slightly slower, which is what you guys have been seeing. But I am making consistent progress, I'm working towards it, and I'm not backing down. Because obviously for people who observe, I don't find cutting particularly easy. I don't find fat loss particularly easy, but at least I can be honest about what that is that's causing it. You think it's caused from the fact that I starve myself and I do too little cardio? That's what keeps me at a pretty high body weight. All that extra cardio I do in starvation, I'm going into starvation mode. No, it's because I'm hungry. I have an insane mind-boggling appetite. Now, a lot of people are saying, oh, you said before you were gonna train for some aesthetics. That was a long time ago. And remember, there was someone interfering with my diet at the time. If I see something that I want to eat, if I've eaten pretty well, followed my diet for the day, and I see a slice of pizza, and I really want that slice of pizza, I'm going to eat a slice of pizza or a bowl of ice cream. Now, do I do that sort of thing all the time? No, but if I'm out and about, or I'm at a restaurant, or with friends or family, I'm not going to avoid delicious foods that other people are eating to follow some arbitrary diet of some type. I'm going to eat that. And most of the time I stick to my general thing of whole foods, high carb, moderate protein, low fat, and I try to get a lot of fiber and vegetables in. And it seems to be working well for me right now. I'm making good progress and I'm happy with the results. And the discomfort of starving myself, uh, doesn't weigh out against any perceived benefits of getting ripped. Uh, I just don't see any perks to being ripped versus having to suffer. Now, I can admit that. So what I need to work on for now, for the rest of the year, I'm gonna work on my physique so that people on YouTube will decide that I look like I actually left. And since I do have a background in human biomechanics and sports physiology, I think I can pull this off. So I've changed my training, you guys will see over time, I'm doing that. I'm going to make a transformation for you guys, and I will put it all in an ebook when I'm done for everyone to look at. It for people who gain fat easy, how to get the type of physique that they want. People like me, the easy gainers. So it's coming along nicely. A lot of people may not notice it because I have a shirt on, but my fat loss in the last two weeks has been pretty dramatic. I have partied my ass off this week, and yet I haven't gained any weight. Uh, Gain. Actually, if anything, I've lost about half a pound. I've gone out every night for the last three nights and partied really, really hard. And you coordinate with all your lady friends who are trying to diet and lose weight. Fortunately for me, I have like three right now who are really trying to take their training a little more seriously and diet get in shape. So what I find works is that working with them, they're going to do all these house parties and going out and things. Coordinate with them jello shots. To where you can do things like sugar-free gelatin or sugar-free jello for jello shots some people don't even have to do that like Brittany everyone's like man your girlfriend should really be giving advice to everyone on how to get in shape I get a few people who joke and say she should be giving it instead of me because of the transformation she did but I'm like I, I coached her she's following my routines now obviously on her mind guys again I'm not a bodybuilder I'm not gonna look like a bodybuilder I will probably get lean enough to have abs in the next few months as I continue to cut down so anyone thinks I'm obese still now or that I've had an unhealthy or unathletic body fat, they literally have a mental disorder. They don't know anything about human body composition or health at that point. I've got visible abdominal muscles, guys. I'm not sitting here fat. I've got quite a bit of love handle left, but, you know, I'm not fat by any medical definition of the word. I'm five foot nine, 218. I have 18 inch arms and a 50 inch chest. Let me get something else out of the way up front. A lot of people, every time I make a video on this, they say, well, Jason, you shouldn't be talking about fat except in true obese. You are in the minority in the fitness world. The people who have these ideas of everyone needs to be ultra ripped or they're obese, people who are classifying me as obese need to realize I am not medically obese by any definition of the word. And if you're trying to classify me as obese, I'm sorry, you need to get psychiatric help. You have a major body image disorder. Uh, because of whether people seem to realize it or not, I am obviously at the healthy body fat level. Uh, again, bodybuilding world has some weird ideas and they get all in the online fitness community. But I am way overweight due to the amount of muscle I have. Occasionally people say things like, oh, you only bash on people being really ripped and talk about the risk because you can't get ripped. No guys, I don't want to get ripped. I bash on getting ripped because it's stupid and dangerous. 
and I don't see any merit to it. I see it as all risk, all damage with absolutely zero reward and zero payoff for doing it. It's stupid. You still have to bust your ass to make games on gear. Really? The science says you're full of shit. All of you guys are full of shit. It's all drugs and it's all genetics. That's all bodybuilding is. The reason some of these guys look so fantastic, they're genetics. You just put the right drugs into the guys with the right genes and they're going to look amazing. It's nothing to do with what they know. It's about the parents they picked and uh, what needle they put in their butt cheek. That's it. That's all bodybuilding is. Nothing more, nothing less. Just is what it is. Think about it. Stop and think about it. And all these guys want to pretend that you need an amazing work ethic, an amazing knowledge of training, and to bust your ass, and to know how to eat, to gain muscle. Bullshit. A lot of the bigger YouTubers do give me credit here. They all watch my stuff. They get ideas from me. And that is the fact that every single person on earth should be lifting weights for the health benefits and the quality of life benefits that it gives based upon all the data and research that we now have. If it actually starts to feel like a sacrifice or a struggle to you, you are wasting your life doing something that you don't enjoy that's completely optional. Quit doing it. It's as easy as that. It's that simple. All you have to do is just say, screw it. I don't want to do squats anymore. I don't want to do leg presses anymore. I want to go to the gym one day and we can do a few uh, curls and crunches and go home. That's all you have to do. At any time, you can make that choice and just say, that's all I want to do. You know what? Fuck it. I don't want to work out anymore. It's just too hard. Well, why should I work out? Why should I work out? You know what, guys? Look, every human being on the planet who wants to be healthy should be lifting weights. Everyone. There's no excuse not to. Everyone can find the time to get to the gym and lift two to three days a week, no matter who you are. And the benefits of it make it intrinsically valuable to every human being on earth. So this whole idea about their struggles and the sacrifice and their hard work, if you really see it as hard work, uh, you should probably <laughs> reconsider what you're doing. I'm just saying. So there are a lot of health and quality of life benefits to lifting weights that every single person on earth should do that requires a commitment of less than two hours per week. I go in and deadlift two or three times every week. I usually work with 500 pounds for working sets and you know what? Some people will call that hard work. I don't. I like deadlifting. I enjoy doing it. If I didn't enjoy doing it, I wouldn't do it. I don't really think it's hard. If I felt like deadlifting was hard, I would quit doing it. And those of us who know these benefits, those of us who lift weights, we should really go out of our way when we know these things. It is morally imperative that we spread that word to people we care about, people we love, our loved ones. We should be passionate about that, those of us who are into fitness. We need to do our best to help encourage the people that we care about in our lives to lift weights for these reasons and do so in a way that's not going to push them away from it because it could actually be the difference between someone that you love and that you care about your mother, your brother, your sister, your cousin from getting cancer or diabetes. It is that big of a deal. So people need to end with this silly bullshit about sacrifice. It's just ridiculous. Come on. If it feels like hard work or sacrifice to you, then find something else to do that you enjoy more. But what I find is that if you suffer from body dysmorphia at all or muscle dysmorphia, uh, the best thing you can possibly do is to completely stop caring about your appearance at all and actually tell yourself it doesn't matter and tell everyone else it doesn't matter and the best way to reinforce that is to make fun of everyone who cares what their body looks like and as crazy as that sounds and it might seem like a dick move i found that when i started making fun of bodybuilders and saying wow you guys are a bunch of fucking faggots when you do that it reprograms your brain and then when you, you reprogram your brain to where you see people who train for aesthetics as beta bitches, 
and you see it that way in your own mind, they're not all that way, guys. And that's just not true. And that's not, not saying that that is true. But what I find is that when you take that mindset and you think that they're laughable and pathetic and they're a bunch of little cocksucking faggots, anyone who cares about their aesthetics, when you take that mentality in your head, your body dysmorphia completely disappears. Because you step back and go, well, I don't want to be a cocksucking faggot. I, I don't want to be that person. Fuck that. And when you make that mental association with your head that they're all beta pussies, everyone who cares about their appearance as a man, your body dysmorphia goes away like that, like fucking instantly. It's just like it throws a switch in your brain to where you go, well, who gives a fuck?